Should we start now? Yes, I can try to use any the link to share from here. Hello, everyone. Maybe let's get started for the tutorial. Um, can can you guys on, on Zoom hear me? Yes. Great, great. Yeah, so welcome everyone to the tutorial. My name is Guo Hao Li, a last year PhD student at Kaos uh, in Saudi Arabia. So I'm here today to present our tutorial on graph machine learning for visual computing. I'm honored to organize this event uh, with uh, Guo Chen, he shoes Cyril from Kaos, and Ali from the Meta Reality, Reality Lab, Matthias from the Intel Labs and uh, Bernard from Kaos. So um, before the invited talk start, I will give a very brief introduction about um, graph machine learning and why we care graph machine learning. So the first question is, um, why is graph machine learning important? So, so we see lots of uh, data that lie on those regular grade structure, such as image, video, audio, and test, and uh, even board game. For those uh, regular grade structure, we can use convolutional network or recurrent uh, new network to model them easily. However, in uh, lots of uh, real world application, there are lots of data um, does not lie on those uh, regular grade. Um, such as a uh, very complex graph structure data, um, such as uh, social network, citation networks, molecules, um, 3D point counts, and uh, 3D meshes. For those, uh, uh, for those data, we need a powerful tool to represent them. Um, there's a uh, graph network is uh, proven to be one of the most promising tools to represent those complex data structure. Um, so uh, one of the uh, advances in uh, recent, uh, in, in the Google products is this uh, chief uh, placement. In, in Google team, they use a uh, graph network to design a uh, new chips uh, use graph network. Wait. Um, I think, uh, yeah. And uh, the other um, important advance is um, using graph network for uh, physical physical simulation. We can simulate the real physical work, use graph network. And maybe you, you use Google map on your phone. And, uh, um, and recently Google team, uh, Google map team also use graph network to improve your uh, estimate type of arrival on your Google map. If you are using uh, your Google map recently, you might find your uh, ETA estimation is getting better and, get, and better. And one of the nature paper which uh, published recently used graph network to uh, help with the mathematician uh, to propose uh, conjectures um, 
to how we solve in the open mathematical problem. And uh, there are lots of data in visual computing also have this uh, underlying uh, graph structure, such as in computer graphics, we use scene graph to represent um, a scene. Uh, in this uh, example, each uh, object can be represented as a node in the graph, and each object can associate uh, can be associated with some subject object to represent this uh, scene. In um, in image understanding, people use uh, superficial graph to represent the image graph. Uh, we can group uh, the similar super similar pixel together to form a super pixel, and then use this super pixel graph to uh, to do image classification or image segmentation. In human modeling, people use a uh, graph to represent human faces and uh, uh, human skeletons. Of course, in, in 3D computation, we have uh, unstructured data such as point count and 3D meshes. Uh, people also use graph network to, uh, to deal with those data by building a KN graph or use uh, the connection of the node uh, on your mesh, or on your face, right? So, so there are lots of um, there are lots of graph structure data in your task. They may be uh, they come from the natural of your data, or they uh, they are high. There are some hidden structure on your data. So that's why we care graph machine learning. So in today's uh, tutorial, uh, we will have a speaker, and uh, they will be presenting six talk. Um, three of them will be uh, on work, it will be what will be virtual talk and three of them will be presenting in person. Uh, each talk will be uh, 15 minutes long and uh, including the QA session. After the first three talks, we will have a 20 minutes break and uh, after the 20 minutes break we will uh, have our next three talk intermediate. In today's in today's uh, tutorial, we will cover uh, the core series of uh, machine graph machine learning and uh, one of the most uh, popular graph machine learning programming frameworks. And then we will cover the application of uh, graph machine learning, such as uh, application in video and uh, application in 3D, uh, physical reasoning, and uh, also robotics. So uh, please allow me to introduce our first speaker, Peta. Peta is a staff research scientist at DeepMind and also a lecturer in the University of Cambridge where he got his PhD from. Um, he's, uh, one, he's the first author of the Graph Attention Network, which is one of the most uh, popular graph con convolutional operators that we use for dealing with the graph structure data. Hi, hi, Pat. Hello. Great. Nice to have you here. Yeah, great. So, thank you for uh, thank you for having me. And uh, can I can I share my screen now? I think I need you to stop sharing for me to be able to share. Okay. Let's try. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let me know if you can see my slides. Okay, great. So I think we can get started in this case. So, hey everyone. Uh, today we will be kicking off uh, this tutorial session with uh, a talk about geometric deep learning, as the title implies. And uh, to kind of seed this particular discussion, we would uh, probably want to have a, a bit of a grounding in uh, what is exactly the thing that we mean when we say geometric deep learning? Why might it even be a good idea to think about geometry in the context of uh, machine learning and especially deep learning? And uh, to try to motivate this particular connection, I'm going to kick off this talk by taking you back in time. And when I say back in time, I mean way back in time to uh, about 300 BC to the days of Euclid, 
Uh, Euclid, as you know, is the uh, inventor of what we know today as Euclidean geometry. And for many, many years, this was the only way to do geometry. So if you were doing geometry, you were basically doing Euclidean geometry and the foundations of which have been outlined uh, in Euclid's elements, including various uh, important postulates such as the parallel postulate, which is uh, given here at the corner of this slide. And uh, for many, uh, for many centuries, people have tried to verify that indeed this is the true way to do geometry by basically um, trying to assume that this parallel postulate is false and then trying to drive a contradiction. But what actually happened, uh, as you probably know, uh, was that uh, around uh, the 1800s, which were a very exciting time to be studying geometry, various mathematicians have shown that not only do you not arrive at a contradiction, you end up discovering completely new self-consistent geometries. So especially Lobachevsky and Bolyaev were among the first ones to discover this and uh, laid the foundation for what is now known as hyperbolic geometry. And specifically Bolyaev, when he first made this discovery, is uh, infamously quoted as saying he's discovered such wonderful things that he was amazed. Out of nothing, he has created a strange new universe. So there's truly some really exciting stuff potentially hidden in here. And uh, it was further extended through the work of Riemann and the various elliptic geometries that he had proposed. So doubtlessly, the 1800s would have been a very exciting time to study geometry because suddenly there was this explosion of brand new ideas with their own terminologies, their own setups, and so on. And uh, you know, a question that any incoming student of geometry might be asking themselves is, you know, what is the one true geometry? What is the specific uh, assumptions that they should assume to be the most general ones to be used uh, for uh, any problem that they start facing? Well, uh, only a couple of decades were necessary before the first foundations for solving this problem came about. And it came through the work of uh, this mathematician by the name of Felix Klein, who had uh, at this time in the 1870s just been appointed for a professorship at the University of Erlangen in Germany. And uh, his research program that he proposed at the time, which is now uh, commonly known as the Erlangen program, has actually proposed in itself a blueprint that could be used to study all of those geometries under a common lens of invariances and symmetries formalized using the language of group theory. And uh, this has been one of, in my opinion, the most influential ideas uh, in mathematics in, uh, in recent centuries, especially because it had massive spillover effects in mathematics and otherwise. So it's very hard to overstate the impact that this program had. Obviously, it helped us unify all the geometries that uh, were around at this time. And this was primarily formalized through the work of Ely Cartan in the 1920s. But beyond that, it had great effects that spilled over to other areas of science. Perhaps the most notable area is uh, physics through the work of Emmy Noether in 1918, which basically showed that all conservation laws in physics can be rediscovered just by appropriately applying a symmetry-based argument. And in fact, uh, similar ideas through irreducible representations are what led us to what we now know as the standard model uh, in physics. That's the classification of elementary particles. And uh, for the computer scientists in the crowd, you might know category theory as a very popular uh, method for reasoning about various aspects of theoretical computer science. And uh, specifically through the words of the founders of category theory, Eilenberg and McLean, their entire area can be seen as a direct extension of Felix Klein's Erlangen program. So one very simple idea of trying to geometrically unify uh, a bunch of approaches in the area in the 1800s has led through truly amazing spillover effects across all of science. And now I can now you might be wondering, you know, why am I telling you all of this in a tutorial which is fundamentally based around deep learning and graph machine learning, right? Well, specifically, if I take you now to the year of 2020, uh, deep learning is all the rage right now. We have all these different amazing architectures being proposed. And usually with these different amazing architectures, we have different kinds of potentially bombastic statements like... Uh, Everything can be seen as a special case of a convolution. Uh, everything is a special case of graphs, so you should be using graph neural networks. Transformers use self-attention, and as we know, attention is all you need. And long short-term memory is Turing complete, so why would you ever need anything else? 
These kinds of statements make it very exciting to be thinking about deep learning, but it also makes one beg the question of if all of these different architectures are claiming to be the one true architecture, which one is it really? So if history is to teach us anything at least, the area of deep learning circa 2020 feels a lot similar to the field of geometry around the 1800s. So if history really is to teach us anything, now is the time to look back to the various geometric principles and to try to use them to uh, truly make sense of this zoo of architectures in a more principled manner. And uh, since this is a tutorial on graph representation learning, and I do come from uh, a graph representation learning background myself, you might be asking yourself, could graph neural networks be a possible answer to this question? And you might be right, because if we squint hard enough, many or any neural networks can be seen as message passing over a particular graph structure. And this here you can see just some examples of the graph structure that might be induced in a fully connected layer, a convolutional layer, and a recurrent layer. So at least intuitively, we might believe that graph neural networks could play a part in this one true architecture. But in order to properly make sense of this, we must be able to understand graph neural networks beyond just the notion of permutation equivariance. And this is what uh, my tutorial is going to be all about. And with that in mind, it is now our turn to study geometry. My name is Petar Velichkovich. I'm a staff research scientist at DeepMind and an affiliated lecturer at the University of Cambridge. And together with Michael Bronstein, John Bruna, and Taco Cohen, we have set out uh, on a journey to uh, discover uh, exactly these connections, which you have summarized in a 150 page proto book that we put on the archive. You can find a lot more interesting goodies at geometricdeeplearning.com. But now for the purposes of this talk, let's take you on an interesting geometric journey through the foundations of deep learning. So for this particular tutorial, we're going to start by just reasserting the case for why we need to plug geometric constraints in our architectures. This is basically because learning in high dimensions is a fundamentally hard problem. And in fact, uh, it's often intractable. As you know, from the curse of dimensionality, even under very simple constraints on your target functions, as you scale up the amount of dimensions you're doing the learning in, you suddenly require exponentially many training samples to properly fit uh, that kind of training data. So high dimensional learning is cursed and low dimensional learning, as we know, often drops a lot of fidelity in the inputs. So how can we deal with this problem? We stay in high dimensional learning, but we try to inject some assumptions about the geometry of the problem through the use of inductive biases. So now we're still doing a high dimensional problem, but we're trying to only work with functions that, uh, that respect the underlying geometry. And this might make our high dimensional problem more tractable simply because the space of possible solutions is much smaller. And here are a few popular examples of inducing geometry. So in the case of images, you might want to process this image data independently of any shifts. For example, in the case of this cat image over here. Uh, for a more exotic domain, if you have data that lives on a sphere, you have the smiley face on a sphere, it is still the same smiley face no matter how I choose to rotate it along the surface of the sphere. So spherical data should in principle be processed independently of rotations. And when it comes to graph representations, which is the area that we're all here to listen to, this data on a graph should be processed independently of any isomorphisms. So here I've given you two graphs. If you stare at them, you'll see they're exactly the same graph. I've just chosen to present them to you in a different way. And ideally I should get exactly the same answers when I try to run my neural network on those graphs. So let's try to take these intuitive ideas and try to formalize them a bit more concretely. So first, in order to do that, we're going to need a bit of mathematical background. So we will first define uh, a domain omega, which uh, stores uh, our data. So in the case of images, omega could just be the set of all pixels of the image. And then we endow the, the different elements of the domain omega with uh, some features from a set C. So basically we define a signal X as a function that maps individual elements of our domain to the corresponding features uh, that they have. So this set C is usually some real vector space. So in the case of input image data, it will typically be a three dimensional vector space telling you the red, green, and blue channel uh, dimensions of an image. And then we can define the space of all C valued signals on omega as this capital X of omega C. It's just a set containing all those possible signal functions we can have. 
And uh, what's very convenient for us, because deep learning often rests on linear algebra, because often our domains and computers will be discrete, we can represent these signals not as functions, but as matrices, capital boldface X, which is just a, a real matrix with the number of rows equal to the number of items in the domain and the number of columns equal to the dimensionality of our feature space. So the ith row of this matrix will give you the features of the ith node of the domain. Okay. Now, once you have this kind of structure of signals, you can then uh, impose some interesting properties on it. And typically you'll want uh, them to support these linear combinations in a natural way. So if I take any linear combination of two signals, it is the same as first looking up the signals in each of the two parts and then linearly combining them. And this means that the space of signals forms a vector space. And often we can also define an inner product on these spaces, which can be very useful. Uh, where we just basically integrate over all possible pointwise dot products at every possible point of the domain. And these two conditions taken together mean that our space of signals is just uh, a Hilbert space. Now we can start talking a little bit about symmetries. So before I zoom in on what do I mean by a symmetry of an object, I, you know, if you think about it, it's basically a transformation that you apply to an object and it doesn't change the underlying object. So we might look at it in a different way, but it's still the same object. Now, one very important point here is that just the very act of me saying that this is what a symmetry is imposes some properties mathematically that a symmetry must have. And uh, in this particular case, just to show you an illustrative example, imagine that my domain are these uh, triangles and I'm storing data in the three corners of a triangle. So some possible symmetries I could apply to that triangle are rotations and horizontal flips. And here you can see exactly all the possible ways in which I can present this same triangle, depending on the way I choose to rotate it or flip it and the various connections between those transformations. So the R's and the F's are the symmetries of this particular triangle. And as I said, because a symmetry is a transformation that leaves the object unchanged, this immediately defines a few properties that it must have. We must have an identity transformation and it must be a symmetry because it trivially doesn't change the object. If we have two symmetry transformations, we can always compose them and get a symmetry as a result. And also symmetries must be invertible because if I cannot invert the function that I just did, I've lost some information. And as a result, the object hasn't been unchanged. And further, the inverse must also be a symmetry itself. When you combine all these axioms together, in fact, you recover a very standard and well-appreciated object in mathematics, which is the group. And here I've just listed out the various properties that group transformations must satisfy. So we have a set G, which contains all of those transformations that we care about, and some binary operation GH, which is basically a, a composition of the two operations. And that composition must satisfy the following properties. So it must be associative, so if we have uh, three transformations applied uh, in a particular order, it doesn't matter how we choose to pairwise compose them, we'll get the same result. There must exist an identity which satisfies the obvious properties. There must exist an inverse which satisfies the obvious properties. And there must be a closure property. So whenever we have two elements of a symmetry group, composing them will also be part of the symmetry group. On the right-hand side, I've shown another case of a very interesting symmetry group, which is actually rotational symmetries of a Rubik's cube, the group O of H. So basically, the symmetry group in our case is just a group of some transformations G that take points on the domain and move them somewhere else in the domain. And the group operation will just be a composition. But when we talk about groups more abstractly, there's just a set of elements with some composition rule which satisfies these axioms. So to properly be able to work with groups, we have to tell something about how the group operation acts on data. So we can define the so-called group action which uh, takes a symmetry group element G and, an, and a domain element uh, from omega and tells you where that particular element ends up such that some obvious properties are satisfied. So there's associativity with the group action and also identity applied to any point in the domain leaves it unchanged. And here's one particular example of what a group action might look like. 
on Euclidean planar motions. So here you rotate by some value and you translate by some vector. You can always create some kind of an action matrix, uh, as you know, from computer graphics, which can be applied on the coordinates to transform them in this particular two-dimensional space appropriately. And once you have uh, an action of a symmetry group on the, on the domain, we can also, also automatically obtain an action of it on the signals. So I can apply my symmetry transformation not only over omega, but also over signals over omega. So G of X, where X is some signal, is the same as looking up X on the point that will end up at U after applying G. So it's X of G to the minus one of U. Why is this the case? So when I apply G to G to the minus one U, I'll get U as a result. And that's where I want to look up X. And here is it visualized on the case of rotating a sphere and then a point ending up in a particular place after applying a rotation transformation G. And further, we will almost always assume that this group action is a linear operation such that uh, if I have a, a linear combination of two signals like these two insects superimposed together on an image, it doesn't matter if I first add the signals together and then apply a shift or if I individually shift the two signals and then superimpose them together, I'll get exactly the same outcome. And why is this convenient for us? It's convenient because then I can define uh, a representation of my group action in a way that completely stays within the realms of linear algebra. And this is obviously gonna be very useful for deep learning because we reason about most of deep learning in the lens of linear algebra. So we say that the n-dimensional representation of a group is a map rho, which takes elements from the symmetry group G and gives you a unique n by n invertible matrix, which satisfies uh, the operations of the group and satisfies the, uh, uh, and satisfies the required associativity loss. And here's one specific example of how a group action might look like for cyclical shifts of a particular one dimensional signal. It basically gives rise to the usual shift matrix just raised to a particular power. And now with this notion, since we have a linear algebra definition of uh, a group actions, now I can talk about what it means for my function to respect these symmetries in G. So first, uh, if we expect that the output of our problem does not depend on the symmetries of the data, we can talk about G invariant functions such that, uh, so these functions or these neural networks F are such that no matter what symmetry operation I use, uh, uh, I use row of G to represent its matrix representation. If I apply it to the input, I'll get exactly the same output, regardless of whether or not I applied it. And this can be reasoned about in the case of image classification, for example, where your output class should not in principle depend on shifts of the image. So this is the property that usually a convolutional neural network might encode. However, sometimes, so this invariant prediction gives you one prediction over the entire domain, so one class over the whole image. But sometimes you might be interested in making predictions over individual elements of the domain. So in the case of images, this might correspond to segmentation, where you might be predicting a segmentation mask and every uh, prediction in every pixel must follow any shifts in the input in this case. So we need a more fine-grained notion of G equivariance, which is for every group action G, uh, it doesn't matter if I apply it before or after applying my function F, I'll still get exactly the same result. So in the case of segmentation, what does this mean? If I translate my input image, I will not get exactly the same segmentation mask, but rather it will change in a predictable way. It will shift in exactly the same way that I shifted the input. Now, these two properties in and of itself are not enough usually to ensure scalable and stable learning. And in fact, usually we want an extra constraint, uh, which is we want our signal to be stable under slight deformations of the domain. So we might have a particular input image like this, and you know we might build our convolutional neural networks to be resistant to shifts, but nature is usually not quite uh, as uh, ideal as this. So it might shift our image, but it might also distort our house a little bit. And a CNN is not by default designed to deal with these kinds of distortions, but we can actually mathematically derive what might be meaningful properties of a neural network layer to be able to deal with these errors so that they don't immediately propagate everywhere in the input. And the conclusion in this case is that 
rather than doing global layers, the layers should be local on the domain and only deal with local neighborhoods of a particular uh, domain input. So that's why CNNs are usually constructed with very small convolutions, like three by three kernels, but make them very, very deep to stack the effects. And using all of these different ideas together, invariance, equivariance, and locality, we arrive at the key building blocks of geometric deep learning, where we have equivariant local layers and invariant layers, as we discussed before, if they're necessary. The reason why we're happy with these equivariant layers just being linear is because in deep learning, we typically inject nonlinearity by just the pointwise activation function, which is applied to every part of our signal separately. And there are many universality results that show that if you combine linear equivalent layers with just pointwise activation functions, you get universal approximation properties over these domains. So there's no need yeah. to do anything more complicated than this. Uh, sorry, was there a comment? Uh, okay. And the last part, uh, which is, um, uh, which is, uh, Sometimes important, especially when you deal with images, is this local pooling or coarsening layer where we sometimes go with, over inputs of a particular domain to try to coarsen them on some smaller domain omega prime. This is very useful for images, not that useful for graphs in recent times, so that's why we don't talk about it as much in our write. And all these components taken together can actually form the basis of this blueprint of geometric deep learning. So you stack equivariant layers, you add some nonlinearities in between, you pool occasionally if necessary. And finally, if you need a prediction over the whole domain rather than individual nodes, you add an invariant layer at the end. And these taken together actually are expressive enough to derive any architecture that you might want to deal with uh, uh, over various kinds of data. And in our book, we show that basically all the fan favorites are derivable by choosing the right kind of domain, the right kind of symmetry group, and uh, just uh, you know working out the maths from there and figuring out how they uh, how they do this. In the book, we provide examples for various characteristic domains. I will use the remainder of this uh, tutorial, the time that I have, just to show you how this works in the example of graphs. So first, uh, before we start learning on graphs, uh, we are going to have a more simplified learning setup. We're going to uh, look at uh, learning over sets, which are basically graphs uh, with uh, no edges. And uh, in this case, we just have nodes and we have features of the nodes because we usually deal with features in deep learning. Uh, so Xi is a k-dimensional vector representation of the features of node i. You can then stack these features. That's what we typically do in representation learning into a node feature matrix where the number of rows is the number of objects and the number of columns is the number of uh, dimensions of the features. So the ith row corresponds to the features of the ith object. Now, the very act of stacking these features into a matrix is bad because it specifies the node ordering and we assumed our set is unordered. So we'd like the result of any neural network applied to this to not depend on the order. So what we want really is this interesting permutation invariance property where no matter how I present to you the different elements in the set, I should still get exactly the same response. And uh, it will be useful when we define this rule to think about operators that can change the node order. And as you know from combinatorics, these operations are known as permutations. For a set of n elements, there's n factorial, many of them. And uh, conveniently, we can use the idea of representations of a group action to note how each permutation defines a unique node by node matrix, which that has exactly the desired effect, the so-called permutation matrix. Here you have a specific permutation matrix for the permutation 2413. And the only effect it has is that when you left multiply it with a feature matrix uh, of nodes, it just permutes the order of those nodes and does nothing else. So it's ideal for what we want to show. So now directly applying our ideas, we can actually derive that a very generic architecture called deep sets is a very uh, concrete example of a permutation variant architecture over sets that has an equivariant layer applied to every node in isolation. Here in sets, the only notion of locality we have is the node itself, so that's what we use. And then at the end, we apply some aggregation, permutation variant aggregation, if we need to predict stuff on the level of the whole sets. And uh, this is typically as far as we can get with sets without assuming or inferring additional structure. 
And uh, the applicability of such models is quite apparent in computer vision. Point nets, which were concurrent to deep sets, basically derived many of these kinds of ideas and showed that they work really well on point cloud problems. Now we augment the set of nodes with some edges between them. So we consider graphs, uh, G, which are a tuple of not just nodes, but also edges. We typically represent these edges in many ways, but uh, for the case of linear algebra, I'll just use a slightly inefficient representation, which is the adjacency matrix. So it's a matrix of nodes by nodes where each element is either zero or one, depending on whether that pair of nodes is connected with an edge. And we can add more things like edge features and so on, but I'm ignoring them uh, just for the sake of keeping the maths less tedious and uh, the findings are largely the same. And the desired errata over graphs are the same as the ones over sets, permutation and variance and equivariance. So what's changed really? If this was the desirable property for learning over sets, for learning over graphs, it's exactly the same desirable property. It's just that now I have edges that I have to carry around and be mindful of. So I can extend uh, the ideas of invariance and equivariance from sets to graphs by just basically adding adjacency matrix as part of the input. And whenever I apply permutation to the features, I need to also apply permutations to the rows and columns of the adjacency, which ends up PAP transposed. So we get permutation invariance over graphs as no matter what permutation matrix P I choose, if I apply it to the features and the adjacency, I'll get exactly the same results. And equivariance, no matter what permutation matrix I choose, it doesn't matter if I permute the features before or after applying my function. Now, one thing that's exciting about graphs and you don't get it in sets are these idea of neighborhoods. So on sets, there was no real neighborhoods, every node for itself really. Here, we suddenly have a broader context. Each node has a neighborhood, NI, of all the nodes directly related to it. And using those neighbors, we can extract neighborhood features, which I call X and I is just the multi-set of all the node features adjacent to a particular node. And now our local function doesn't just have to look at one node, it can also look at the whole neighborhood features around that particular node. And we can then apply this function in a distributed manner on all the neighborhoods of a graph and uh, basically uh, stack the results in an updated node feature matrix. And so long as this function is invariant to the order of the neighbors, the whole function will be equivariant to uh, across the graph uh, permutation symmetry. And it's a fun exercise to prove this. Uh, it's just a simple algebraic manipulation. Now I've derived all of this math to be able to show you this. So what we've been setting ourselves up for is this basic recipe for graph neural networks. And we build them as basically a shared application of a permutation invariant function phi over a node and its immediate neighborhood set of features, and then just applied uh, in a direct way to all neighborhoods separately. And once you have a model like this, you can have a graph input of some node features and adjacency structure and applying your graph neural network, you update your node features to some values HI. Uh, the adjacency typically doesn't change, but there are very exciting methods recently that also try to change that. And once you have these latents, what can you do? You can directly classify the nodes by learning a node classifier over the H's. You can also classify entire graphs, but much like what we did with deep sets, you have to somehow compress all the node vectors into one latent in a way that doesn't depend on the order. And typically summing them or, ad or averaging the features is a good way to do that before you pass them through a classifier. And on graphs, you also have this another exciting modality, which is the edges. And you can predict properties of edges or even predict existence of edges, which is a task typically known as link prediction, as just some classifier over the features of the corresponding nodes and maybe some edge features between them if you have them. And I haven't told you much about how to actually implement this local function around the node and its immediate neighborhood. And I don't have enough space in this tutorial for that, but I'll just highlight that there exist three possible flavors of GNN layers, convolutional, attentional, and message passing, which uh, from left to right are less to more expressive at the expense of being less scalable and potentially prone to overfitting. So basically, uh, these are the three main flavors, the convolutional, where you just compute a simple weighted sum with fixed coefficients over your neighbors, attentional, where you use attention mechanisms to compute these intermediate coefficients and aggregate based on them, and message passing, where the sender and the receiver node collaborate to compute an entire vector, message vector to be sent across and aggregated in the receiver. 
And before I conclude the tutorial, well, this part of the tutorial, I just like to make a brief note on transformers. So if I take this rule for the attentional GNN and I make my neighborhoods the entire set of nodes, so it's a fully connected graph, I actually recover exactly the equation of the transformer. So I have this attention mechanism over all pairs, and I use these computed attention coefficients to aggregate my neighbors. So using a fully connected graph with an intentional flavor, we can actually make the connection that transformers are graph neural networks. And uh, the only way in which transformers get specialized as sequence models is by injecting these positional embeddings. If you drop them, you end up with a fully connected graph attention net. And these pre-computed features, they give hints to the model as to where you are in a sequence, but the model is not at all required to use them. The main symmetry of a transformer is permutation equivariance. And you can think of this attention matrix as basically inferring some soft adjacency and therefore letting the graph neural network choose its own edges. For a much more interesting and deeper discussion of this, I invite you to check out uh, Chaitanya Joshi's uh, review uh, in the gradient under the name transformers or graph neural networks. And uh, I think this is basically where I would like to stop. I had some more material planned, but uh, basically uh, it is about as much time as I think I've been allocated for this. So just to briefly recap what we covered, we looked at the geometric foundations of graph neural networks, invariance and equivariance, the symmetry group actions, deep sets, graph nets is a special case for learning over graphs, transformers as a special case of fully connected attention GNNs, and parts which we didn't cover here, but you can definitely expect to find them in the book, composing symmetries over geometric graphs and learning over manifolds and meshes. Last point I'll make is that we have a book and an accompanying lecture course all available on geometricdeeplearning.com free of charge. And we're actively trying to improve all these materials. We recently got accepted by MIT Press for a 2023 release of our book. So any and all feedback would be very much welcome. Thank you so much. And thanks again to the organizers for the opportunity to present at this great event. Thank you. Um, thanks, Peter, for the very uh, amazing talk. Uh, any question from the audience? Yeah, you can uh, come here. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the amazing talk. Uh, I had a question about essentially the locality of graph neural networks is interesting because um, I think there seems to be some problems if you were to rely on like long dependencies. So say, you know, you have this locality constraint where you only learn from neighboring nodes. What if that's not enough? So say you have to perform message passing over, you know, long dependency, you know, obviously multiple edges. When you use like typical uh, fixed architecture, say CNNs, and you use like attentional mechanisms, like a non-local block, you typically can fix that. But for graphs, it seems that, you know, that's kind of difficult, or at least it, it looks difficult. So what's your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. This is a very important point. And uh, I didn't have enough time in this tutorial to like properly cover it in great detail, but essentially it is a big problem to be able to quickly reach different parts of the graph and pure locality might not be enough, but there do exist a lot of very standard approaches to deal with this problem in practice. One very common one is to introduce a master node, which is connected to every other node. And now suddenly the diameter of your graph is reduced to just two. So you only need two hops to cover the whole graph. Of course, this might put a lot of pressure on the master node. So in reality, there's a lot of recent fun approaches that live somewhere in the middle in the sense of having like uh, nodes responsible for certain substructures like simplicial complexes and so on, and then passing data from the nodes to their substructures that then talk all to each other. So basically various more or less smart way of cutting down the diameter of the graph and making it more communicative it seems to be a good way to, pers to persist the benefits of sparsity, but then at the same time to not have these issues. But thanks for raising that. It is a very important problem. Any other questions? Uh, for the audience, you can come here for the questions so the speaker can hear, hear you better. So maybe Petra, you can also take some questions from the Zoom. 
Uh, all right, yes. So let's see. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you all for the great comments. I would maybe start by, so there was a question on how to apply the geometric deep learning to Euclidean data. Yeah, this was actually one part that I did not have a lot of time to cover, unfortunately. In our book, we have a very nice part where we show how this all specializes to images. The idea is you can see an image as a sort of grid graph, which is endowed with coordinates. And now those coordinates actually matter. So you can encode basically translation equivariance by various combinations of circulant matrices, which specify all the convolutions. So it's basically a special case of a graph neural network where your edge connectivity comes from the locality of the image kernel. And uh, also uh, in this presentation, I also had uh, some parts where we talked about you know, learning over manifolds and meshes, which I didn't have time to cover. But basically, you can also do learning over geometric graphs, like these molecules where different atoms have 3D coordinates. This is very important also for recent uh, benefits in protein folding and these kinds of uh, quantum chemistry papers as well. And one simple way in which you can use the geometric blueprint to enforce permutation symmetry, but also Euclidean symmetry, is by, for example, plugging the distances between the two nodes as an extra input into this message function. This is the essence behind EN equivariant GNNs that were recently published at ICML. So yes, there are many ways in which, uh, yeah, in which you can use these ideas to deal with uh, Euclidean data. Uh, do you have... Any other questions from the live? Uh, yeah, I guess there are many other questions on that Zoom. Mm -hmm. I'll answer one more. Uh, I, I'm assuming we should also make time for the next tutorial, right? Uh, but basically, uh, there was one question that just came in on do the three flavors have limitations to learning on graphs or is there room to improving them? I'd say that's a very interesting open question uh, in that... Uh, probably there are different perspectives that will allow you to think about those flavors in a different way, like specialize the message function to be more mindful of certain symmetries or topological structure in the data. But from the point of view of the fundamental building blocks of graph neural networks, probably they are already expressive enough to cover everything you might ever conceive of. And I talk about this in my position paper on uh, message passing all the way up uh, that was recently published at an iClear workshop. But basically the idea here is you can get away with one hop local message passing to express pretty much everything so long as uh, you allow yourself to modify the structure of the graph before you do this. So everything kind of amounts to message passing, just the graph over which you're doing it might be potentially very different. Yeah. Thanks for the answer. We still have time to take uh, one last question. If, if Daniel, then let's send Peter for his talk. Thank you very much for having me once again. Thank you. So for the next talk, we have Matthias there. Um, Matthias uh, is a uh, um, is the co is the founder of Python Geometry and now is the founding engineer at uh, Kumoto AI and he got his PhD from TU um, TU dot mod and um, let's welcome Matthias for his talk.
Hello? Does it work now? Yeah, it's working now. Can you oh, hear us? <laughs> sure, the heart attack. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to speak at CVPR and for such a great audience. Um, thank you very much. So my name is Matthias Fey. Uh, I'm about to finish my PhD next week. Um, and currently also employed as a founding engineer at Kumo AI, uh, who built um, GNNs for industrial applications. And today my talk will be more about the practical aspects of graph neural networks in particular, how we can efficiently uh, implement them in practice uh, and apply them for different tasks and applications. Um, so I also have a brief introduction into graph neural network. But most of that was already covered in the previous talk, so we'll quickly go over that. And so graph neural networks update new representations by repeatedly transforming and aggregating representations of their direct neighbors. And so we can think of that blueprint um, of that function f, which is uh, parametrized, and it takes in some central node representation uh, in layer L uh, of a node V. Uh, and it also takes in this multi-set of, of features of, of the direct neighbors of, of that node. And what we get as an output here is a new representation of that, of that certain node uh, for the next layer. Uh, and so this blueprint is then often decomposed or referred to as a message pattern scheme in the, in the sense that it has three major building blocks. One is that we first send a message uh, per edge or per neighbor to the given central node. And that message can be uh, written as anything you want. And it often is referred to as taking like the input of the source node features, but also like the destination node features or optional edge types and so on. And so that gives us a new vector or new representation back. We can use this representation now um, to aggregate these messages across all neighbors that point to the same destination node. And so this aggregate function is usually referred to as a permutation invariant or permutation equivariant function. It isn't required to do so, uh, but it is often done and most GNN operators just simply use a sum or a mean or max aggregation. After that, we get a vector back that represents the direct neighborhood of, of each central node. And we can use this representation to update the central node representation using a different or another uh, function, which we often call update. And so that update is often implement this as a simple skip connection or similar. And so importantly, all these functions are trainable and differentiable. So we can use them in a deep neural network and use them as building blocks that can we train uh, jointly and end to end together. And importantly, all these functions are shared, like have shared parameters across nodes and graphs. And what that means is that we can easily apply them to unseen graphs um, and, and unseen nodes as well. And so if we use these layers, these message passing layers in a deep neural network architecture, um, then they can be also stacked and enhanced by nonlinearities. And what that means is that after L layers, we've exactly aggregated the L hop neighborhood representation around each node. So if you have like L layers, then the representation that each node has corresponds to a view of the local subgraph around that node. Um, in general, this, this message passing scheme is super flexible uh, and nearly everything can be implemented with that. In particular, besides all these standard GNN formulations, you can get really, really fancy here. For example, you can use any isotropic transformation, which means that um, the message not only depends on the, on the source node features, but it also depends on the destination node features. And in that way, you learn different transformations for each neighbor uh, individual. Um, you can also apply your message passing scheme across different edge types. And that means that you potentially can learn a different transformation uh, for a neighbor depending on which edge type it has a connection to the central node. Uh, importantly, it can also incorporate edge features. Um, there exist many different ways how to do that. One of the most famous is that we can 
uh, condition some kernel function that takes in these edge features and basically learns a transformation um, that, such that we can transform uh, the given neighbor. Um, and so um, graph neural networks um, using this message passing scheme are super flexible, but they're also generalizing all these concepts that we know from different domains. So for CNNs, these learn discrete local patterns that are universally applicable. And the GNN does actually do the same. So it aggregates the local neighborhood around uh, each node or each pixel uh, and aggregates it together. And all of these patterns that we learn, these are universally applicable over all nodes in our graph. But instead of like limiting ourselves to discrete kernels or a fixed neighborhood size, we can now incorporate varying neighborhood sizes and can actually learn continuous kernels that are used to transform a given neighbor. Uh, the same holds true for the transformer, uh, which we've uh, known from our earlier talk. And so transformers build features of each word, of each word uh, by attending to all other words in that sequence. And that is, uh, that is similar to uh, the concept of message passing that uses attention, but within a fully connected graph. And so GNNs both uh, generalize CNNs and transformers and actually many, many more architectures. What in my mind uh, is the important takeaway here is that GNNs uh, actually define a new paradigm of how we define neural networks. In particular, I don't see them as much uh, dependent on, on, the, on the operating on graph structured data, uh, but more of how we define neural network in the sense that um, the computation graph of our neural network is no longer fixed or part of our pipeline, but it's actually part of the input. And so we can just change the input and our deep neural network behaves differently. Um, importantly, um, due to the generality of message passing graph neural networks, there exists like a large amount of applications. Uh, one of the most common one in graph machine learning is, for example, recommendation in social networks. Uh, we want to recommend users, uh, products, or new friends, or whatever. Um, we also see them applied in chemistry, where we learn on molecular graphs. Uh, and want to predict certain molecular properties. And we also see them use knowledge graphs where we want to infer missing, missing links or missing knowledge. Uh, for computer vision, uh, we see them also used in 3D processing where we learn like local patterns of geometry, for example, given on mesh-like data or given in the form of point clouds and so on. Uh, we also see them used in graph matching, in particular for the task of key point matching, where we are given uh, a set of key points per images, and the task is now to find correspondences between keys, uh, key points in different images. Uh, one major big topic is the field of scene graphs and motion capturing. Um, for example, scene graphs uh, are used or describe uh, objects in, in a scene, and these objects can be given by a, a bounding box detector or object detector. And now we can use these, these, we can now use GNNs to infer or relate all these objects together and to manifest our understanding of that scene. And so for motion capturing, uh, the same was true where we represent our scene uh, into human body parts or joints. Uh, and now we can use GNNs uh, um, to operate on the skeleton data and, and to process this data. Uh, one of the most rising fields where GNNs are used is a view of our structured world model where we now no longer, um, no longer um, see our world as, as an unstructured place that, that fits into a, a single latent vector. Um, but we actually want first learn about objects in our world and then can use GNNs um, to relate these objects and to make better predictions afterwards. And so there exists a lot of function, uh, a, a, a lot of applications, a lot of GNN flavors and so on. And so this talk will mostly focus on how we can implement them efficiently. And one solution towards that is um, the Python Geometric Library, uh, which I developed during my PhD. And that is a PyTorch library um, 
to enable basically deep learning on graphs, point clouds, and manifolds. So it is basically the missing piece of PyTorch um, to enable graph neural networks. And so PyG uh, simplifies implementing and working with graph neural networks. So it should be super easy to write your new GNN layer, to write new GNN models that fit to a specific domain, to a specific task. Uh, it should also bundle state-of-the-art GNN architectures and training procedures. So you don't have to rewrite everything from scratch. And you can also directly compare yourself to state-of-the-art and related research. Uh, most importantly, we also try to do that as fast as possible. So we always aim for high GPU throughput on highly sparse data of varying size. And in particular, we do that by providing some extension libraries that are especially designed to work on um, sparse and, and graph specific data. Um, and late, uh, lately, we are also trying uh, to make PyG both suited for academia and industry. Uh, for academia, that means that PyG needs to stay flexible in the sense that research should not be limited by its scope. Um, and for industry, it means that we also want it to have to be comprehensive and easy to use such that new advances in, in graph representation learning gets immediately applied um, to industry applications as well. And so for myself, I like to frame PyG as PyTorch on the rocks. And what that means is, is shown in the given uh, figure. And that means on the left side, we have a CNN uh, that is a two layer CNN. Uh, and it follows like the, the classic PyTorch principles of defining, um, G, uh, defining operators in the in the init uh, of, of a class of a module and then defining the computation graph uh, as part of the forward method. And so here we define two convolution operators on the left and in the forward, we just enhance it by a non-linearity. On the right, um, this is actually how a GNN module looks in PyG. And so uh, it, it nearly looks the same so we again have our constructor, but instead of initializing convolution operators that expect grid-like data, uh, we now have um, operators that expect any graph structure as input. Um, and so here we specify again the input and output channels of our GNN. And in the forward, there's this crucial missing piece uh, where we now take in the input, the node feature matrix, um, but we also define this edge index representation that basically says, how our node features or how our nodes are connected in that graph. And that edge index is typically just a long tensor that stores like pairs of node indices that represent source and destination nodes. With that, um, the ex execution looks exactly the same, um, but we also always take this input of, of uh, the stuple of, of node feature matrix and graph structure as input. Um, Importantly, we now take a look at how message passing is implemented in PyG. And in PyG, every graph that we represent is given in a sparse format. And that means that we only store the non-zero elements of our adjacency matrix. And so our graph is given as a, as a node feature matrix H0, uh, which basically uh, represents the initial state of, of the node features or the features of every node um, stacked into a big matrix. Um, and then we have this edge index representation I, uh, which is given in the form of a two times number of edges uh, matrix. And on the right, you can see a simple example of how that may look like. Um, so we have our source node in the first column, and then we have our destination node indices uh, in, this, in the second column. Uh, importantly, we transpose this edge index representation here to have like contiguous access to a source and destination node indices. And so optionally, we also uh, allow edge features and many, many more attributes depending on the uh, GNN layer and architecture. And so to recap, we want to implement this message passing scheme, which is decomposed into these three parts, where this aggregation operator is usually a permutation invariant op operator, such as sum, mean, or max. And so in order to implement that, we make use of a really flexible implementation in the form of a parallelizable gather and scatter scheme. And that is all condensed into a general message passing interface. And so what that means is that we first 
um, gather all the information, all the feature vectors into an edge parallel space where we can compute the messages in parallel. And so for each uh, message or each edge we want to compute a message for, we actually materialize all the different representations. And that means that we can now apply any message we want um, uh, in the in the batch wise in the batch wise mode or in the parallelized edge level representation mode. Uh, after that, we have a net message for each uh, edge available, and now and now we can scatter or aggregate all these messages together depending on the destination node index. And here we make use of scatter aggregations that mean that. Uh, we utilize atomic operations, uh, which highly parallelize across different de um, destination nodes uh, and features. And so this scheme is parallelizable in all these three parts. And finally, we are back in node level space. And that means that we can now uh, combine or update our node, rep node level representation uh, by the previous representation and the aggregate of the scatter output. So how does it look like in code? So imagine that you're given um, this edge convolution operator on the top right, uh, which just computes a new node representation uh, by taking the max over all neighbors um, where the message is computed using an MOP uh, on top of the concatenated input of source and destination node features. And here XI refers to uh, the representation we want to compute the uh, embedding for, and xj uh, refers to a neighbor representation. And so there exist four steps to define a new message passing uh, um, um, layer. The first one is that we have to inherit from message passing. And so we can just write our edge conf by inheriting from message passing interface. Next, we need to select an aggregation scheme to use. So we can, you can also uh, define your own aggregation scheme, uh, but most people, most GNN layers just make use of a predefined set of aggregations. And so here we just input into the uh, base constructor that we want to apply a max aggregation scheme. In the forward pass or in the forward computation, we just say, need to say at some point that we want to start propagating messages. And so we do that by calling the self.propagate call, and that which is conditioned on this edge index representation. And after that, everything, uh, everything is passed to that call that is later needed to construct messages. And here we just need the node feature matrix um, to construct our messages. Internally, this self.propagate call will call the message function. Um, and that message function um, has the capability uh, of inferring all the input arguments uh, from this self.propagate call. And so we can just say that we request um, the source node representation and the destination node representation uh, by calling this uh, underscore J and underscore I in the input arguments. And so this will automatically convert um, the node feature matrix AX um, to, to an edge level representation depending on whether you're interested in the source or the destination node. Uh, I'm, using these input arguments, we can then compute the message fully in parallel. So we could just uh, concatenate them together to form some kind of edge feature uh, and apply our MLP on top of that. And that is all we need to do to implement this simple edge conf layer. Uh, in general, these message and update functions are really easy to write and compute uh, since they only operate on individual elements. So we've seen earlier that we can just apply a simple MLP uh, in the batchwise mode uh, for all these different edge representations. And the real challenge really lies in, in providing efficient aggregations. And I simply want to, uh, I quickly want to recap um, the different modes of the different strategies of performing aggregations in GNNs. One, uh, is the scheme that we've seen earlier, which is called like the gather and scatter scheme, where we start with a node feature matrix, and then we have this intermediate edge level representation uh, that computes all these messages in parallel. And after that, it aggregates all these messages together to again form a new node feature matrix. And so we've seen this scheme is very flexible um, and it is very fast for sparse graphs. Um, 
importantly, it will struggle uh, on more denser graphs, in particular because it is very memory inefficient or memory bound in the sense that we explicitly need to materialize this edge level representation, which can get pretty big uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with dense graphs. Um, so one alternative to that is the sparse matrix multiplication approach. Uh, we just take this uh, edge index representation and re really represent that as a sparse matrix. And then you simply uh, take the mat, mat null uh, of this adjacency matrix with a node feature matrix. Um, and the output will be uh, a new node feature matrix uh, that just aggregates from all the different neighbors. Uh, importantly, this scheme is less flexible uh, because it is only applicable to a certain set of operators. Uh, in particular, as a general rule of thumb, you can only use um, uh, this scheme on, on GNN layers that only transform the neighbors uh, with the same transformation matrix. And so it does not really can incorporate edge features and it does not really can incorporate uh, central node representations. And so it is considered less flexible, but whenever there is a GNN layer that can be uh, framed as, as sparse matrix multiplication, there's really no reason to not uh, use that or leverage that fact. And so if we can represent our GNN layer as such, it is very fast and very memory efficient to just perform a sparse matrix multiplication. Uh, another approach I want to highlight um, is the, the degree bucketing approach. Uh, it is pretty hard to visualize. Uh, I will try to explain it. Um, it. As far as I know, it is pretty common in computer vision and it's also got pretty popular through the GGL library. Um, and here the idea is that we um, uh, again have an edge level representation, but we reshape that into a representation uh, um, of the form num neighbors times the max degree um, times the number of features. And so the idea here is that we have a dense representation of our edges where we can use dense operations to perform the aggregation. And that is like we perform the aggregation in the second dimension. Um, importantly, you can, you can do this for uh, each degree possible. So you would have a, have a list of representations where only the number of degrees, the second dimension changes. Um, you can also prevent to have too many uh, different representations uh, by using padding and so on. And in, the, in the best case, uh, when all, um, all nodes in your graph have the same amount of neighbors, you can have just this big uh, edge level representation of shape num nodes times uh, the degree times the number of features. And the cool thing about this approach is that it actually can implement any aggregation. And so we, you can basically use any PyTorch dense function available to perform the, uh, to perform the aggregation such as LSTMs, um, GRUs and, and so on. Um, the downside is that this comes as a trade-off. So it is very memory and inefficient. And in the worst case, uh, it, is, it is far more memory in, inefficient than the gather and scatter approach. Um, if we um, use a, a higher number of degrees or a higher number of buckets in which we group our representations um, using padding, then this will amount to a sequential iteration where we iter need to iterate over all these representations and perform the aggregation uh, sequentially. And so there's a trade-off, but if you're uh, aggregation cannot fit into the scatter or the sparse matrix, matrix multiplication approach. Uh, this is usually a good alternative. Um, the last um, uh, last um, aggregation scheme I want to talk about is what I call the individual kernel, um, which just means that we have a specific implementation or a highly optimized implementation for a given GNN layer. And that is given through uh, CUDA or low level code. And that means that it's not flexible at all, but you cannot really get faster than that or more memory efficient. On the downside, it is to note that it's practically more applicable for inference cases, uh, since you will lose out on the ability to reuse intermediate uh, tensors during the backward um, call. So you would have to recompute them um, to uh, compute the gradients for the given parameters. One thing I also want to talk about is 
that over the last few years, they had a lot of research uh, being put into finding better aggregations. And what I mean by that is that we've seen aggregations that are learnable. We've seen aggregations that are attention-based in all kinds of forms. And we've also seen the usage of multiple aggregations where we combine them and, and concatenate, concatenate the results together and so on. And so previously, PyGE did not really have that concept of an aggregation as the first class citizen. Uh, but we're actually about to change that with the usage of our new aggregation package. And the, the idea here is that we expose any aggregation uh, uh, as, a, as a simple base class, which the user can customize and, and fully extend. And so the idea here is that uh, instead of providing this aggregator with some call, you can actually define any aggregation you like. You can also combine them together, um, uses this multi-aggregation function, which just takes as input a list of different aggregators. Um, you can combine some aggregation with attentional aggregation or even LSTM aggregation. Importantly, each aggregation uh, will pick up the best format that is needed um, to compute its representation. And so for some and attentional aggregation, we can still make use of this fast and flexible scatter operation of sparse matrix multiplication. While for others, such as LSTM aggregation, we default back to this degree bucketing approach. Um, while it is not yet fully integrated, optimization of the scheme is also possible in the form of fusion, where we can say, uh, we want to fuse the aggregation of different, um, well, we want to fuse the multiple aggregations into a single execution. And that has the advantage that we can reuse um, the vectors, the input vectors across the different outputs and do not need to access them every time we compute a new aggregation. Um, PyG also supports mini batching on many small graphs. And I just want to highlight that here because it's really famous and, and pretty important uh, topic when you start building GNNs. And the general procedure here is that you uh, represent your set of, of graphs uh, as one giant supergraph. And so that supergraph just um, has uh, a set of isolo isolated subgraphs that denote your, your input examples. And you can actually do that by just stacking your adjacency matrix uh, in a diagonal form and concatenating your node features in the node dimension. Uh, importantly, this will not require any GNN modifications uh, because as you can see, um, this, this, this super graph or message passing on the super graph will not ex exchange messages between examples, uh, between nodes and, and different examples because they do not share any, any edges. Uh, and also it does not have any memory or computation overhead because our, all, our, um, all our adjacency matrices are imp in, uh, implemented as a sparse matrix uh, or in a sparse form. And so we only store the non-zero elements. And in addition, it supports examples of varying size. And so what that means is that you can directly uh, load in the data set given in PyG you instantiate that data set and put it into that PyG data loader and PyG will automatically take care of providing um, this correct mini batching approach. Uh, one thing I want to highlight is that uh, PyG merges these batch and node dimension into a single dimension. Uh, and in my understanding, since I've worked so long with that, it's, it's super intuitive. I understand that people have problems with that and there's an alternative approach uh, emerging that is called, or that is referred to as nested or ragged tensors. And the idea here is that we still have this notion of exposing the batch dimension, um, but um, the, actual, uh, the actual dimensions can change in, in size. And so what that means is um, that our tensor is still represented or exposed to us as a three-dimensional uh, uh, tensor. Um, but each element in, in this tender or in this matrix can have varying size. And so if you, if you look at, at the Torch PyTorch um, package, it actually has support for nested tensors uh, in the latest release. And you can just do this uh, or create this nested tensors uh, by just passing in a list of, of different uh, individual matrices that potentially may have different sizes. 
Uh, I want to highlight that this sits at the heart of the TensorFlow GNN library. So if that sounds interesting to you, um, you should have a look at that package as well. Um, and the PyTorch API is in, in for nested tender is in prototype stage. And we've seen to integrate that into PyG as well anytime soon. Uh, I quickly want to give a short example of how PyG workflow looks in practice on a simple toy example. So um, consider that you want to perform point cloud classification and you want to do that on a, on a toy data set, which is called geometric shapes. PyG provides that data set and that data set contains 40 examples uh, of, of different shapes, which, which you simply want to classify into a given category. And so you can just instantiate that um, data set in PyG, specify a root directory, and, and PyG will take care of downloading and processing that data set. And if you want to access a um, given graph or given example of the data set, uh, you can simply do so by index notation. And if you print that out, it will give you a nice overview of what is actually contained in that in that graph, in that in that data example. So here we have like a position matrix, which is of shape number of nodes times a three, like it will have a three dimensional coordinate uh, for each node or each point. It also has a face matrix of shape three times 30, which means um, these are just the uh, indices of defining triangles in our mesh. And then we have this Y attribute, which is to note the category of our data object. Um, you can use point cloud sampling, or you can use the concept of transformations in PyG to simply convert your data to a new representation. So transformations take data in and output new data. And so the sample point transform will simply uh, sample points from mesh uh, phase area um, uniformly and give you a point cloud back. And so after printing that out, you will actually see you have a position matrix um, that is now a shape of 256 uh, times three instead of the original mesh um, object. You can even compose transformation using the compose transform class. And where you can say, we first want to sample points. And after that, we want to uh, create a graph out of that that just connects the K nearest neighbor of each point. And so uh, when you do that, you will see that you've get an additional attribute in, inside your data object, which is called edge index. And that is have the shape of two times the number of nodes times the number of uh, neighbors we, we requested for each node. Um, given your data, you can now easily, uh, easily instantiate your GNN model and apply it for training. Um, so given our edge uh, edge conf representation from earlier, we can just instantiate two operators and we can also instantiate a final classifier that maps our graph level representation uh, to one of the certain classes. And in the forward call, we just stack our convolution operators and we apply a global max pooling um, that is also that is conditioned on the node representations. After, two, after the two up layer um, aggregation and this additional batch vector, which denotes uh, to which node each example, uh, to which example each node belongs to. And on top of that, we apply this final linear transformation, this classifier. And then training this uh, looks exactly the same as in regular PyTorch. So you instantiate your model, you instantiate an optimizer that takes in these parameters as input. Um, you define your data loader to I get mini batches back and, and, and apply the training in mini batch mode. And then you simply iterate over your data. Uh, you clear the gradients of your optimizer. You compute the forward path of your model. Um, you compute the loss based on the predictions of the model and the ground truth labels. Um, you apply your backward propagation, which gives you gradients for your parameters and then apply uh, the final step call, uh, which updates the uh, parameters according to the gradients. Uh, I quickly want to go over some additional highlights before running out of time, um, since this is just a shallow overview of, of the high-level concepts of, of PyG. There's much more to discover. One additional highlight is heterogeneous graphs. And so we have full support for heterogeneous graphs, which are different node and edge types. And there's also the uh, ability to convert uh, standard GNN models into their heterogeneous counterparts which is very convenient to use. 
uh, we give a lot of um, focus on scalability. And so we, uh, we try to, to make a, a GNN model scale seamlessly to large graphs uh, with more than uh, eight different samplers available. And the general procedure here is that you, instead of having a data loader, you now have a loader that samples subgraphs from your graph. And so it just takes in a single data object and gets, uh, and gets you back a subgraph of that. Uh, we also tried to integrate Torch script in the sense that you can easily convert your Python module into a standalone representation. Uh, we've worked hard to bring back, uh, to bring in PyTorch Lightning support in the sense that uh, it easily gives you multi-GPU support. You can choose different accelerator types and simply call trainer.fit afterwards. Uh, and we worked hard to bring in ex explainability in GNN predictions uh, across a variety of GNN models, data sets, and tasks, and that all out of the box using the Captain library. Um, so overall, uh, PyG has been a great success so far. I really appreciate all the support and, and thanks for all your contribution and, and issues and so on. Uh, it helps the library uh, tremendously. Importantly, PyG already has its own ecosystem on its own, so that's pretty cool to see. So there exists extension to perform temporal learning. Um, there exist higher, higher level libraries to make it easier to use. There exists library for distributed training and so on. Um, we've made great effort in giving users a good introduction into GNNs. And we provide over 80 examples across different tasks and also recently published some graphing tutorials on Medium, uh, which is fully realized with PyG and, and corresponding notebooks. And with that, uh, I'd like to conclude my talk and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks for the impressive talk. Any question from the audience? Um, for, yes. The one you have about uh, the Can you can you repeat the question? Uh, can you hear the question? Maybe. Sure. No, no, you, you have to. Maybe. Sorry, maybe you can uh, come here. So, no, really, sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my workshop about graphing your networks. Um, no, the slide you had earlier about like conclusions of graphs, um, is that hardware dependent? So those conclusions basically for forms of hardware which are specialized towards dense major transportations like GUs, TPUs, etc. Um, first question. Um, so the slides of aggregations are um, was mostly about GPU uh, um, programming style, uh, where you can actually use the scatter and scatter to parallelize across um, across edges um, using atomic operations, um, degree bucketing to parallelize using dense representations and so on. I assume um, it is the same for TPUs, um, but I have to say I'm not that familiar yet with that. Yeah, um, I think at least the stuff about gather and scatter and sparse map moles should be the same my experience um and then as there's more interest in like uh efficient implementations of sparse neural networks uh like from a hardware perspective do you expect this to change uh the graph neural network community at all or at least the conclusions on that side uh, that's a good question um one thing i i think where like this gpu programming style comes to its uh uh, limitations is the processing of heterogeneous graphs where you actually want to 
parallelize across different node and edge types. And we might see better hardware support that actually can make better use of heterogeneous graphs and parallelize across that. Um, so it is quite an effort to implement a challenge, uh, a fast um, heterogeneous GNN variant on, on GPUs. Uh, thanks, Matthias. Uh, actually, I have one question. Uh, so for the for those uh, efficient application scheme, uh, what is your uh, recommendation for the user account for the visual computing um, people for example, doing these accounts and meshes? Uh, which which uh, application scheme you recommend? Uh, it's a question like which recommendation to use for um, computer vision? Yes, for point calls and uh, meshes such uh, special graph structure data. Um, I would say uh, if you're if you're if you're working on a k nearest neighbor graph, there's nothing better than the degree bucketing approach because you can just reshape that into the given form. You have to be cautious in the sense that your your graph needs to be ordered according to destination nodes in order to do that. Um, but it is quite, if you're just leveraging like scatter max, scatter some um, aggregations or mean aggregations, then the gather and scatter approach can be competitive to that too. I would say uh, it doesn't really matter uh, that much which approach you use here. Importantly, the sparse matrix multiplication approach does not work in the point cloud processing scenario. Since we're in the point cloud processing scenario, we always have edge features or want to intercorporate central node representations. And so it isn't really applicable here. Thank you. Thank you.
it's not presenting. Okay, good. All right, so thanks everybody for coming. I know I stand between you and the next break, but bear with me. I think the first two talks did a great job setting up this talk. So talking about the mathematics or the theory behind graph networks and the platform that you should all use if you're interested in using graph neural networks. Um, and that leads up to the applications, right? And so I'll be the first talk on this and after the break, there'll be several others. Um, I just want to say that one thing to keep in mind is that a graph is defined by nodes with certain features representing the individual nodes, edges connecting different nodes together, these edges might have features, and a graph neural network layer really is a message passing layer that aggregates information between the node features together, so you hear, a, you, we talk about neighborhoods of nodes, so given a node there's a neighborhood around it, and you aggregate information and message passing among the neighborhood. The neighborhood could be large, could be small, it could change from layer to layer. So what Peter was saying about adjacency matrices as this A matrix, that A could change from layer to layer, giving you some kind of a dynamic uh, a graph structure from layer to layer. Just keep that in mind, that's kind of the setup for what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about how we use graphs for video tasks, three of them actually in particular. Uh, before that, I have to put up the, the, the faces and names of all the great people that made this work uh, happen, especially our organizer here, Gil Hao, did an amazing job putting this uh, uh, workshop together, as well as lots of the uh, cornerstone work for, um, for, the, uh, for the papers and, and research that I'm going to talk to you about. A special thanks to our collaborators also. Um, so let's get started. Before we get to applications, I want to talk to you a little bit about the work that we've done on making these graph neural networks go deep, deep as CNNs. Uh, so you know of a ResNet 150, I'm sure, and a 101 and a 51 and all that. Why do we go deep? Richer representations, you need to increase the field of view, all the nice stuff that uh, we all know. However, back in the day, back in the 2019 era, the uh, so we, we've done quite a bit of work trying to extend uh, the depth of these graph neural networks into, um, into that kind of level of depth as CNNs for the same reason, enriching the representation, increasing the field of, uh, field of view. Um, the, we started out in 2019 with the work at ICCV, it's a vision conference uh, paper, not uh, anywhere else. It was called Deep GCNs. And it, for the first time, showed that Although the state of the art GNNs that were that came before, um, the deepest one could have been maybe up to five layers, there was something preventing uh, the training, the reliable training of networks to go deeper than five. And these reasons, they're they're pretty well known now. Uh, these are the three up here: overfitting, oversmoothing, vanishing gradient. Um, so uh, several of them are specific to graph, uh, two of them are specific to graphs, well, one of them is specific to graphs, two of them are pretty generic, we see them in the CNN world. Uh, the work that we've been doing since 2019 till now have enabled us to address to a certain extent these, uh, these three problems and has allowed us re you know, recently, as recent as last year, to train uh, GNNs that go to a thousand layers. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about the history of that first of going deep with GNNs and then the applications to video because we needed the depth to be able to in, build and an enrich a representation for whatever video task we were dealing with. So let's start with that. On the, on the plot on the left, you see the training losses for various graph neural networks. This is on a particular task. It's not a video task. It's a, a point cloud task, but for, that doesn't matter. Uh, the trend that you see is that the deeper the network is, if you just take a plain GNN, uh, message passing GNN, um, uh, where you have these uh, modules that we saw before connected in composition, uh, you see that the deeper the network is, the, the more unreliable it is to train. <clears throat> Sometimes it diverges. But you see on the right, a plot of a residual GCN, a, 
uh, GCN that has residual connections. And why, why is that important? I mean, we know how residual connections were very important in ResNets to allow for deeper CNN training. And the same, uh, we showed that the same thing actually occurs also for uh, GCNs. So with res GCNs, you can go to 50, 100 layers without leading to overfitting or <clears throat> these various problems that prevented us from going deeper. And you can train them pretty reliably at whatever depth you want. So here's kind of the figure with plain GCNs before you had, uh, my cursor showing, yeah. You had these GNN layers that did message passing, but they were you know, connected in composition. All what we did is, well, not all, I'm not trivializing the work, but I mean, we, uh, we in incorporated residual connections here to allow for this, to prevent or to address the problem of vanishing gradients. And that led to really the, the depth being um, expandable. What else do we know in the image domain that we could make use of? So instead of having only residual connections, what about dense connections? Well, there's dense GCNs also that came out of this work. And that's been used in various other papers and various other applications, including point clouds and, and, uh, and uh, video. In addition to that, there's the altruistic convolutions or these dilated convolutions. If you define them on a regular grid, let's say in the image domain over here, uh, the purpose of a dilated convolution, just to remind everybody, is that you have the same number of parameters as smaller filters, so smaller filter, but you have a bigger receptive field, right? That's the whole purpose of it. So what is the equivalent for a GNN? Well, every node has a neighborhood, right? That neighborhood uh, in a graph is something K size. So for example, in the regular way that you would uh, construct this neighborhood is that you would, this is the node that you're looking at. And then it, it's first four or the closest four uh, neighbors would be one, two, three, and four. So that's equivalent to like thinking about a three by three filter, which is just the immediate neighbors. Well, if you wanted to find the second top neighbors, what you could do is you take the uh, first six or seven uh, neighbors in your, uh, in your graph for that node. And then instead of taking the, uh, the first, second and third in, in, in sequence, you skip. So you do one, three, five and seven. You can do this dilation in however you want. You can skip the neighbors in whatever. There's multiple ways to skip these patterns. This is just one way. So by doing this, what are you doing? You're extending your receptive field by including farther away uh, nodes uh, that are in your neighborhood without increasing the number of nodes in your neighborhood. So similar to the dilated convolutions in 2D uh, CNNs. So in general, with all these kind of uh, building blocks, you can create a... Uh, deep GCN backbone with residual connections, dense connections, dilated convolutions. Uh, they will do message passing among the nodes and therefore they will enrich the representations of the particular uh, nodes in the graph. Then you can do, as, uh, as was shown before, you could have a kind of aggregation uh, block where you aggregate all the features of all the nodes and then take that global feature maybe and concatenate it with the individual nodes in the, in the, in the graph. So you have local features particular to the uh, to the to each node, and then they all get aggregated somehow and get concatenated to every single node. So every node has a kind of local understanding of itself, representation, and a global one altogether. And then you can build an MLP if you want to do the dense predictions or dense predictions on the graph. Let's say semantic segmentation of a graph detection, or if you want to, for example, do a graph uh, classification. Uh, you just put, you aggregate all the features together, as Peter was saying, and you build an MLP on top of that to classify the whole graph. So basically, it's a, it's a common building block for uh, GCN, uh, GNN uh, research, and you can go, you know, pretty much as deep as you want. It's very popular, uh, the PyTorch uh, version at least, and it's in, Py, uh, uh, it's in PyTorch Geometric. It's also in Deep Graph Library, so um, it's very easy to use. We made it so so that. We, uh, we allow people to get up and running with uh, deep GCNs um, with minimal effort. Um, we've seen uh, people use our code base for a variety of purposes, beyond vision, computational chemistry, computational physics, and so forth. So people, people are using this um, in, in various fields beyond their own. The problem that we have still uh, uh, is with going deeper, obviously, is the idea of memory needed, especially during training. During training, we all know, you know, if you do backprop with this, these residually connected, for example, layers, you tend to save the activations per layer so that you can do the backpropagation step, right? 
that is a problem because that blows up the, the amount of memory you need in a uh, um, in training. So it's if there's L layers in your network, you have N number of nodes, and D is the dimension of uh, the features per per layer. Let's say the same; they're the same in all layers. You get O of L and D uh, memory that could explode with bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper networks. So how do we reduce it? Well, we all you know there have been uh, methods out uh, out there trying to uh, batch or not batch sample uh, the end nodes of the graph to something smaller, something more uh, reasonable. So for going from n to b, where b is smaller than n, for example, some you could do a sampling approach, uh, but that doesn't really affect the l dimension at all. And so the work that was uh, that was done last year was to go from l and d to n d in terms of memory complexity, and that's adopting a um, a an idea from the image world on reversible uh, residual connections and i believe at this cvpr there's a paper called reversible transformers uh, i think will be presented later this week um, so the idea of reversibility reversibility is the idea of not needing to save the activations per layer in the backprop step that's the idea so this trade-off of memory with computation and uh, by in by incorporating this reversibility property into gnns you literally can go to a thousand layers, okay? With a memory consumption of maybe three gigabytes that could run on your, your decent commercial GPU, right? You don't need an A100 with 80 gigabytes to, to train anymore. So um, we, this is kind of our most recent work on showing that depth is possible GNNs with a particular, uh, with the particular architectures, reversibility, uh, reversible connections, as well as the tricks of residual connections and um, dilated convolutions and, and the like. So this infrastructure is, is going to be what we're going to use for the particular applications. And for the, all of you who are interested in applying graph networks to your own applications, especially at large scale, I really do recommend that you make use of, uh, of all of this work. Oh, yeah, and we, we ranked number one in some competitions and general graph uh, uh, challenges, and we were um, we were included in a state of AI report uh, about, you know, that said something about, you know, how great, you know, deep networks, uh, graph neural networks are going to be and how great the graph learning is going to be into the future. So without further ado, where can we use all this great toolage, right? We're at a vision conference, so we need to see vision applications, right? So I work on video. One of the themes that I work on is video. Uh, and there, I'm going to talk to you today about the using graph networks and in many cases the, for the first time in three very well known uh, very challenging uh, tasks that the video community is working on um, has been working on for many years uh, the first one is temporal activity localization i'll introduce for you what the problem is if you're not familiar first and then i'll get to how we could set up the problem as a graph problem and uh, so solve it or address it with a gnn of some sort the first one is temporal active activity localization, uh, TAL, uh, video language grounding, it's VLG, and then active speaker detection, which is AST. This by no means limits the, the applications uh, for GNNs, but it just gives you a, a, a taste of what can be done. So let's go to TAL. So what is it? For those of you who know what it is, you can uh, fall asleep for, a, for 30 seconds. Uh, what, what TAL is all about is if I give you a long video, long untrimmed video, and I tell you, find for me the beginning and ending of a particular instance of a particular class of activity. For example, that class of activity could be called pole vault. And you have training examples of what pole vault looks like. So you need to take as input a video and output the, input, the, the beginning and end time of every single instance for every single class that you were trained on. Okay, so think of object detection, but for video. And you're finding something small within something bigger so that flip through quickly so usually what happens in the tile community is that you you have a video you chunk it up into a bunch of frames video these these are called video clips you represent the video clips with a clip encoder that's usually frozen yes we freeze our clips because we can't do end-to-end -end tile just for you to know and whoever is interested in solving this gra uh, holy grail problem please come and talk to me after the talk it is a holy go uh, holy grail problem for us so you have a video, you splice it into small clips. Those are gonna be your units. 
you encode them using a clip encoder, some kind of tensor feature activation, and you do that for all of the video, you get a bunch of tensors representing these clips, okay? And then, you know, you want to build a detector on top of it. That's the point, okay? So usually these detectors that are built are, don't take into account long-term context. That means uh, the, the parts of the video that's over here really don't affect uh, the parts of the video over here, usually. Um, and so to get away from that, to make use of long-term uh, context, uh, why don't we just uh, consider them as you know, all of these different individual tensors as individual nodes in the graph? Once you have these individual nodes, you want them to message pass amongst each other to enrich representations, okay? Based on how important they are in detecting particular activities. So this video now can be written down in this way, in a circular way. So here is where the video starts. Here is where it ends, or here is where it ends. And then you have, uh, sorry, uh, th this is where, uh, let, let, me, let me repeat. So the, the red and the blue are the beginning and ending of an activity. So if you go through time this way, so counterclockwise, this is the beginning of the activity, and this is the, these uh, are chunks inside the activity. This is the end of it. This is some background chunks, background clips, and then you have another activity over here, okay? And so the purpose of activity detection is to find this red and uh, blue um, nodes and what is included inside. So obviously, if these are nodes in a graph, how do you connect these nodes? Simply put, you know, if these two, if two video clips are consecutive to each other in time, they could be connected because one can affect the other in a Markovian way, right? So that, that's why you have connectivity between the nodes over here. So this is how time uh, propagates. And so you have connectivity between these consecutive nodes. But also you have, these, you have these edges or connectivity between nodes far away from each other, even into the background, okay? So meaning that there could be a video chunk or video clip in the background that informs what, uh, uh, or, or propagates information into the action. Why is that important? Because if as a human, you look at a video and I you know, show you a part of the video and I stop and I tell you what's gonna happen next, in many cases, you can actually predict what's gonna happen next because of this context information that we, uh, we, uh, we as humans leverage in understanding how actions propagate or how they uh, uh, follow through. So the connectivity could be in time, but also in kind of uh, semantic connectivity, like how important are these connections in order to enrich the representations. So this is how everything was put together. Okay, so you have a video broken up into clips. Each clip is a node. So you have a node in this graph. You have two types of connectivity in this graph, okay? One is the semantic connectivity, which is a dynamic graph created at every layer. It's basically, you take the features of the nodes and you do a k-nearest neighbor on the features at that layer. And so if you do that, uh, if you do this k-nearest neighborhood uh, search for neighbors in different layers, you might get different graphs per layer. And this is why it's called a dynamic graph. So the structure of the graph is different from layer to layer. And then you have a temporal graph, which is static. It's the same connectivity of all the nodes across all layers. Why? Because time doesn't change. You know which, one's more, uh, which one is consecutive to the other. So, and then we, we, we do it in a way that is uh, similar to ResNext for computation's sake. That's not really a big deal here. So this layer that will aggregate information, these two different types of connectivity for, for the graph is called GCNext, okay? And of course, you, do, you could compose a bunch of these with residual connections and, you know, there could be B of them. At the very end, so now you have a graph of the same size as the input with enriched features, features per node. So we're trying to do localization. So you have this big graph representing the whole video. We want to localize a subset of those nodes inside the graph or a subgraph that corresponds to a particular class label, right? So, you know, we followed, followed the kind of the mechanism for um, uh, faster SNN, the, this idea of having a two-stage approach where you have an ROI uh, align, which is you have some, um, in the image space, you have uh, some anchors, possible proposals of where objects could be, and then you align and you uh, aggregate the features for that proposal. We do the same thing, but for subgraphs in the, in the graph. How do we get these subgraphs? These are temporal. I mean, because the activities that we're trying to detect have to be consecutive temporally. So we sample the anchors temporally consecutive, and that creates the proposals or anchors, and we do the subgraph align for that. So think of like faster SNN meets graph networks. 
this is just a zoom in into the GC next uh, uh, layer. So, you know, like I said, this connectivity on the temporal domain is static all throughout the layers. It follows the same temporal direction, while for the dynamic one or what we call a semantic one, it really uh, depends on what the features are at the different layers. So obviously we had good results uh, on the TAL, uh, on the TAL uh, benchmarks, and that was the first time a graph method actually uh, was used and got uh, you know, good performance on this, uh, on this data set. What's interesting though, is uh, you know, aside from uh, running after SOTA performance, which we shouldn't always do, uh, is uh, what this graph network actually gives us in terms of understanding of how important context is to this video task. So if you take a video like this one, this is an arm wrestling video represented in this circular way. These edges that you see here are the learned edges from the dynamic graph. So for example, you see edges between uh, video clips inside the activity and the ones in the background. That means outside the activity, meaning that there are some in uh, useful information from the background that can uh, relay inside the activity to help you detect that activity. You take another video, same thing. It has connectivity uh, uh, between the foreground of that, uh, the, it has a video that has a, uh, connectivity between uh, the nodes inside the activity and, and the background. So there's useful information in the background. What if we make a Frankenstein video? You take the background, the yellow nodes of this video over here, and you take the green nodes, which is the foreground of this video over here, and we splice them together. These are from different videos. Probably there's no informative, there's no information from the background of the video on the right that helps you with the task uh, of detecting the instance on the left, right? So what happens? Well, because we're dynamically creating this graph based on features, it automatically just creates the edges that are most useful for detection. So what does it find out? It's best for you just to interact within the foreground or within the background. There are no cross cutting edges between the background and the foreground, meaning in this Frankenstein video where we expect the context not to help in detection, there is no connectivity between the background and the foreground, meaning it doesn't really, um, it's not useful and it was learned automatically. So that's kind of the interesting insight that we got here. There's been an extension of this work in uh, last year where uh, in order to target shorter uh, activities, which are very hard to localize, uh, we can incorporate this graph idea inside a pyramid, uh, like a multi-scale uh, localization um, idea where, you know, instead of having a one whole graph at the original scale, you can downsample the graph and then try to do the detection at various levels of this pyramid. So some levels are good for long actions, some are good for short actions. And uh, you know, that, that, can, that can be seen as an extension to what I just talked about. The second activity that, that or second uh, task that I wanna talk about is something similar to TAL. Uh, it's called VLG or video language grounding. Here, we still wanna find the beginning and ending of something, okay? But that something is not one of K classes of activities that you've been, that you've been trained on. Um, it is that something is a language, preform language. So somebody tells you, find for me in this video where a guy is playing the saxophone. You determine the beginning and ending of that. The, sec the other language query could be a guy talks about playing the saxophone. So this query is interested in the part of the video where the person is not actually playing the saxophone, it's just talking about playing the saxophone. So very different. And then the other one is about the guy plays the saxophone again. So you need to understand the language and understand where in the video you need to localize. That again is very important because it means that there was a first instance. You're not interested in that, you're interested in the next one. So video language learning is pretty uh, general as a localization task, but it's pretty complicated because you need to understand both the language and the video together to be able to do this. So this, this is not um, uh, uh, very different from uh, grounding of objects and images and, and, and relations and images and so forth, but on the video side. So in the same way, in the same vein that we did for, uh, for Tal, can we represent this in a graph way? Well, we, I just showed you how a video can be seen as a graph with various connectivity with GC Next. What about language? Well, language can be represented as a graph too. If you look at a, a parse tree of a, of a sentence, that is a tree and a tree is a graph. So in essence, you can create a graph out of the language itself. Again, maybe making use of GC Next as a building block, 
And then you have a graph layer that does the matching. So you have a graph that represents the video, a graph that represents the language, and then you have a matching layer that tries to do a cross attention. Think of it as cross attention between the video clips in the video and the words in the language. And then it does the same kind of localization that we saw before, with, similar to faster CNN, right? So uh, as opposed to before, we didn't have kind of this language prior, uh, language uh, input over here that we need to represent and to match with the video. But uh, here in this case, uh, we have to do that because if the language changes, the result is gonna change. And by doing this matching, what we're ba basically doing over here is that the representation of individual nodes in the graph depends on the language itself. So that again, remember that word again, once that's in there and that is represented using the GC next of the language, that will tell you whether uh, certain nodes in the graph um, corresponding to the video should be highlighted or not, okay? So uh, that's, a, that's just an example. All right, and of course it you know, works very well on, on data sets, uh, standard and uh, uh, data sets that are out there. But while applying these methods, this VLG net on uh, these uh, standard benchmarks, we saw that there's some biases in these benchmarks and we need to upgrade. And so um, I'm gonna do a shameless pitch on uh, a work, this CVPR uh, that's uh, gonna be presented tomorrow on a very large scale video language grounding data set that's gonna be very challenging to the community and it's gonna push us forward hopefully uh, um, with better and better techniques. Hopefully, some, will pe some people will make use of the uh, GNN, uh, GNNs for, for this particular application. Last but not least, uh, there's a, a third task that's very interesting in video, which is active speaker detection. This is at the cornerstone of uh, doing uh, diarization, uh, doing human co computer interaction. So if the robot is in front of you and there's multiple people in front of the robot and people start talking to the robot, the robot needs to know who's talking, who's actively speaking, okay? And to do that, with, you know, kind of to ground the problem, uh, you have a video, you have a bunch of people in these videos represented by face crops. So somebody or some face tracker has been applied or face detector has been applied to the video and that th these face crops are being tracked over time, okay? So you have short tracklets of faces where the identity of the person is the same in the tracklet. And you have audio and these people are talking and it's up to you to tell when somebody is talking. So if there's speech or no speech and who is producing that speech. That's what's called active speaker detection. So it has to do with time, temporal detection of when speech happens and space tells you which of the here, there's four people, which of the four faces is actively speaking, if any. All right, that's the setup of the problem. Guess what? You could use graph networks to represent this problem too. So you, you here, you could design it in a way that is, uh, 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 represents the, the problem in the following way. So you have visual nodes in the graph. These represent those face tracks for individual uh, uh, faces. For example, here in this, this little uh, graph over here, you have three faces. Therefore, you have three visual nodes. They happen in the same time. They, uh, but they occupy different, uh, different places in the, in the frame. So these are three visual nodes and you have an audio node. And there's connectivity between the, uh, the visual nodes, obviously, because knowing who is looking at whom can tell you who's actively speaking, right? So if over here in the bottom one over here, the, or over here, this is the result. These two men are looking, well, they seem to be looking at the woman in the center. And that's an indication that, a visual indication that this person might be the one talking. And actually in this case, she is. All right, so, so there's connectivity between the visual uh, nodes and that of, of audio. And we, since we know, because it's fully supervised, we know which of these nodes is gonna be the one talking and which ones is not. So we can supervise a loss on telling like which of these nodes is the one talking, which one's not. So you have a kind of a, a cross entropy loss there. And you have a binary loss on the audio saying that is there speech or no speech, okay? And what do we do over time? Well, since these, uh, these faces are being tracked over time, you can connect the individual identities over time, again, in a graph form. So you can have a temporal graph if you wanna think about it that way. 
So also, I mean, this way of connecting nodes that are just of the same identity to each other, you can look at it from a dynamic point of view. So there's no reason why this node over here should only connect to this node in the future or in the past. It can connect to any of the other nodes and you could construct a dynamic graph instead of a static graph. So similar to what we saw before with, with tau. So that's the graph uh, representation. That's how we model the problem. And each of these nodes are supervised. The, the visual nodes are supervised to see whether any of them is active speaker. The audio node is supervised to see whether there is speech happening during this time or not. And then you have to represent the whole video over time. So this graph is uh, expanded uh, across time. It does very well and it, it did very well in the, this year's competition. And uh, having said that, I just wanna end the, the talk by re-emphasizing that these graph neural networks that we've been talking about today, they, they have a place in the vision community and it's up to us to find more places for them and see how they can um, uh, not only improve performances, but also in, provide more insights uh, into particular interesting tasks. And you'll see uh, many of them into, after the break, some on scene graph, some on 3D. Um, so whoever is interested in using these, please, uh, I think with uh, Matthias's uh, presentation, the, the, the community, the graph community is making it easier and easier for people to early ad to adopt these uh, tools um, uh, quickly and uh, reliably and efficiently. So uh, I hope this was a benefit to you and enjoy the rest of the talks. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, sorry, over there. Oh, what are we going to do for Zoom? Uh, you might need to come over here, sorry. Okay, um, thanks for the talk. So in the video speaker detection, you are assuming that always you are detecting the face of the people there. So, and then this was a question that I had before, also for Matthias. What happens if you want to encode uncertainty in the graph structure? You don't know if you have some nodes, whatever. That's a good, that's a good point. I think this, is, this should be an active uh, direction for research. But currently in the current mechanisms that we have, if the node doesn't exist, it doesn't exist in the, in the graph. And therefore it's connectivity and whatnot don't exist. But it would be interesting to see, to, to study that further, like the uncertainty of, of nodes and their features and their edges in, uh, in, uh, in graphs. What I do know is that there's applications of generating graph structures, like synthesizing molecules, synthesizing graphs, where they make use of the uncertainty of whether two nodes should be connected or, or not. But in the case of like recognition tasks, I personally have not seen it. So it could be an interesting avenue for research. Thank you. Were well, there was other questions? Yes, please come up. So my question is more of an extension to what we asked. So you're always assuming that the persons are in the you know scene and uh, what if somebody goes in the background and still talking? So it's, I think it's kind of like the same thing. Oh, so this is like a specific. Uh, so um, uh, uh, this in this particular uh, task, this is handled by by, by our current papers, uh, current paper. Um, because think of it this way: so if the audio node is is uh, outputting a prediction that there is speech, but the video nodes are saying that nobody's an active speaker, then what's the answer? Then that this active speaker is outside the field of view of the camera. And so uh, actually, the methods that we've uh, uh, we've built can take that into account. So if the th if, uh, here in this example, there was here in this example over here, there's four uh, faces, but if the video nodes, uh, they predict that none of them are active speakers because of how their faces look like, they don't look like they're actively speaking, but the audio node outputs speech, then you know the, the speaker is from somewhere else outside the frame. And uh, uh, in previous works, uh, that was not possible actually. So the, the, the assumption there was that the active speaker had to be among the uh, faces in the frame. And uh, with this method that we uh, put together, uh, it allows for, for that. So I, I, didn't, I guess I didn't understand that was the, the same question or a similar question. All right, any other questions? We're ready on time. 
before we adjourn, I want to uh, I want all of us to uh, applaud the organizers because putting together a hybrid workshop with internet access problems, you know, getting people on time in person and then virtually is very, very difficult. So let's give them a round of applause. So. Okay, let's thank for the speaker. So after this talk, we have a uh, 20 minutes break. After that, we have three talks uh, in the um, uh, study division and uh, basic reasoning and uh, robotics. Thank you, everyone.
start with a um, talk that's uh, a bit more applied, I would say, with respect to those we've seen before. And we're going to look in particular at scene graphs and how scene graphs can be, first of all, defined and then applied in the context of 3D computer vision. So the talk is divided into four parts. We're going to look through some definitions and applications um, of scene graphs to 3D in particular. And then we're going to look into um, applications of semantic scene graph in images. In particular, we're going to look into those works that represent a starting point for the extension to 3D. Then the third part looks into mostly inference, so how to extract scene graphs from, uh, from 3D data. And the last part would be uh, around generative model and generation of 3D scenes out of scene graphs. This talk will be intertwined with, uh, with Fabian, so I'll go, I'll present the first part and then it's going to go for the second one and so on. So forth. So, um, what do we mean by scene graph and semantic scene graph? In this case, we've seen before some declinations of uh, graph neural networks and graphs to different types of data. In this case, uh, we're looking into scenes in 2D or 3D. So, typically, nodes are the objects and semantic components of the scene and the edges represent the relationship between these objects. So when we look at images, typically this type of relationships uh, can be, for example, actions, uh, for example, holding an object or riding a bike as in this picture, or proximity, for example, being next to, um, to our bike or riding the bike, um, support, comparison, and so on and so forth. Um, There is a direct extension of this concept to 3D, uh, 3D data, in particular 3D scenes. In this case, um, the relationship or edges do not really relate too much to actions that one can make with objects, but more to, um, for example, geometric relationships. Typically, we can say that a certain type of object, like a chair, is supported or lies on the floor, or similarity. For example, if you have four chairs that at the same time type in a living room, you can relate them by saying that they are the same type of shape. Um, it's actually uh, quite interesting to look into the extension to affordances that are that is somehow similar to the concept of action. So how we can uh, make use of certain objects in our indoor scenes, and this is let's say more related to future work at this stage. Um, we won't look into three D objects and three D shapes, but for um, I think it's it's worth to mention that uh, since we talk about three D three D data in general in this tutorial. Uh, that the concept of scene graphs and graphs in general has also been used to model 3D objects and 3D shapes instead of scenes. In this case, the idea is that each node is a semantic component of the shape itself. If you look, for example, at chairs, you can subdivide it into armrests and, le and legs and so forth, and connect them to edges that are either the geometric adjacency or the semantic relationship between the shapes. Um, these methods have been used for different purposes. One of them, I mentioned, mentioned it here, is structure net, where the idea is that we can interpolate between two given shapes, for example, a source point cloud that we can capture with a real sensor in a target image or target shape that we can get from a data set, a database, sorry. And then we can interpolate through the shapes by making use of the graph, underlying graph. And this typically helps to also generate different types of shape from a given category in a semantically coherent way. So it helps building up generative models. Um, in terms of uh, 3D uh, scene graphs, so going back to the case I mentioned before, why are scene graphs and semantic scene graphs useful? Um, typically, uh, 3D scenes, are, let's say, are a very detailed representation of our data, but they tend to, be, tend to have several limitations. One of them is that they're memory extensive. It takes a lot of memory to actually store them. Well, you can think about graphs as a way to um, reduce a lot of the amounts of uh, memory that you need to represent an image. Another typical um, reason why you want to make use of semantic scene graphs is that 3D scenes, in terms of 3D reconstruction, for example, is a very rigid representation. While many applications now in this field are going more towards making use of dynamic uh, scenes, where dynamic doesn't necessarily mean that things move. Uh, in a scene uh, while they're captured, but also that they move, move over time. So we want to detect, for example, real changes in a scene that happen over time, for example, hours or days. And in this case, a semantic scene graph is a very um, powerful representation to model these type of changes. Um, a final uh, advantage is typically that it's a very abstract representation. So we can 
very simply and a very abstract way represent the main components of a scene. I will mention here a few applications on the left hand side, you can see those related to inference in graph from the data. One is, for example, multimodal scene retrieval, where you want to, for example, capture and retrieve a, a certain scene from a database from a single viewpoint that you can capture with an RGB sensor or a depth sensor. Scene change detection is also an interesting application. As I said before, we want to detect what are the semantic changes in a room simply because there was a person that came into the room and made use of the room by moving things around. Um, so we can just directly use the scene graph to detect these changes rather than applying, for example, differences on in terms of voxels or, or 3D points. And finally, compression, as I said before, because it's abstract, because it's lightweight, we can use scene graphs to simply summarize in a compressed way our 3D scene. On the right hand side, you can see applications more related to the generation and generative models. Um, in this case, one very uh, interesting application is the synthetic data generation. So if you can generate realistic scenes through uh, scene graphs, modifying and manipulating scene graphs is a particular easy way to generate a lot of data. And this would be a way, for example, to also bridge the, uh, or say, reduce the symmetrical gap uh, in this case. Uh, the other one was actually one of the main topics that we discussed yesterday in a workshop on computer vision for the building environment. And uh, there's a strong interest for main application, for example, in augmented reality, uh, indoor design, work placement to generate layouts. The example I'm showing here is actually not based on a scene graph, but I hope it help, helps to get an idea of why it's useful to have this type of layouts. For example, we can help designers and work placement experts to generate an initial layout that makes sense, and that then the designer just have, or the architect just have to, let's say, iterate and refine it so it can really speed up and improve this type of work. Uh, finally, I'm going to mention this briefly uh, throughout our talk also scene editing and manipulation. We can modify and manipulate our scenes, images, or 3D scenes by manipulating the graph. And this is another very high level way to, to apply this type of changes. Um, very briefly, in terms of scene graph processing, uh, the idea would be for also for scene graph neural network to kind of rely on very important properties of convolution neural network. One is the fact that it is in a very uh, local way initially, and then there's a receptive field that going through the different layers of the network increases, and then this in, allows the, the, the network to also make use of context. Uh, the other one is hierarchical learning, which is typically start with features that are very basic at the beginning, and then become more and more abstract and more and more, um, let's say, global about the um, uh, object or shape that, for example, we want to recognize in the image. And finally, there's the uh, parameter sharing, which is, of course, one of the, let's say, uh, major uh, reasons why we're making use of CNNs today. Um, the idea would be, can we try to exploit these properties also for our scene graphs uh, while we apply, for example, a scene graph neural network? Um, typically, in the case of scene graph neural networks and inference on scenes, um, the declination of the graph neural networks that's been used relies on a triplet-based approach. So we take our graph, we split it up into triplets, where typically you have two nodes and one edge of relationship. And this can include, of course, the same, uh, the same nodes. They kind of get duplicated. And then the first step is simply a propagation step where we take the initial features of each node, and then we propagate it to an MLP that learns another uh, feature for each of these triplets. Uh, there, then there's an aggregation step where typically you apply a set of concatenation and pooling so that, as you can see here, the same, uh, the feature related to the same node is uh, aggregated together. This is some sort of message passing that if we iterate on top of that can allow basically information to be shared across multiple nodes in the network, even potentially very far away. And the third step is an update step where there's another NLP that learns from this new set of aggregated features and provides a new one that then is used to um, iteratively go through a set of layers of the network. So in this case, you can see that first of all, we can apply a message passing that can involve entire nodes of the network. And the more we go through these uh, layers, the more we increase somehow the, let's say, equivalent receptive field of the network. And the other advantage is, as we were saying before, parameter sharing. In this case, we really have the same NLPs that are kind of shared throughout the layers. And this makes a good use, let's say, of our weights and our memory. So these are quite powerful tools. And the second part of the talk will be related to uh, images, how scene graphs have been used in images, and in particular, those applications that inspired the then application to the data. And for this, I'll...
Yeah, okay, so as Greg already mentioned, while um, we are focusing here on 3D fingers for uh, 3D data, we want to start with uh, images because uh, most of the works that we're going to see later are inspired by, by these works uh, for images. And we first, let's look a look in, let's take a look into uh, what can we do with, um, with, with Syngraph. So one thing is we can basically just start inferring Syngraph. So we start from an image and the goal is that we take this input image and we want to generate the respective Syngraph for it. Thanks. <laughs> um, so we have this RTP image and we want to get to a Syngraph that describes the, the scene that we have seen. Uh, in this work, what they're doing is um, they, they predict the scene graph using an RNN, and then they do message passing, as described before, to propagate the features through the, through the image, uh, through the graph, and then at the end do the prediction on, <clears throat> on the object class. And also they also predict bounding box and say that if you do classification um, using such scene graph approach and you, message, and you do message passing, um, also classification of the object detector improves uh, uh, using these features. So, so you start with simply with taking an image and you run it to a region proposal network to detect all the objects that are currently in, in, the, in the scene. And then you basically build a, a graph by <clears throat> always looking at two uh, pairs of objects. And um, so you basically get the features for each object. And you also get the features for uh, both objects by taking the union of the bounding boxes. And then you have this uh, RNN that produces a state that describes the, the, the current graph, the current node and the edge. And here what they do is they split it in two, basically two graphs, one for the node and one for the edge. They do message passing as described before, aggregate the features and then re keep repeatedly doing this to get high level features until they run the inference for object detection, like the bounding box as you can see on the, on the top and also uh, for the graph. Here are a few examples. So you see um, um, the scene graph for the, for the given image. And as you can see, overall, it seems to work very well. Um, like the, the, the train is, is in the same scene and the, the connections or the, the graph makes sense. Um, next, we can include a graph, but the question is, can we also get the image from the graph? And um, so when we look at this here, we have this graph with uh, two sheep and they are um, on, a, on, a, on some grass. And from there, what we want to get is the respective image. And this work that uh, built again on top of these uh, GCNs um, to process this input grass. And then um, it runs a bunch of uh, forward passes and predicts a layout, which is then turned into uh, the image. And they use some adversarial training to get highly realistic outputs or quite good outputs, I would say. Um, so we start from this scene graph. Um, for each one, we, we embed it into some feature vector. And then we run our graph to predict the layout and the mask. So we, we, we predict the bounding box for each uh, node and the uh, feature and also the mask where the object will be. And then we run a bunch of forward passes with the CNN to get the respective image uh, for this given graph. And um, you can see a few qualitative results again. And the top you see the, the graph with, uh, I think it's again two sheep from some grass. And then in the middle, you see the layout that the network produced with the, with the masks and the features. And at the end, you see uh, the, the final output image. Um, in, the, in the paper, they also described that it works better than, um, for instance, models that are based on text in respecting the overall uh, content of the 3D scene. So it seems like the text models, they often skip parts of the object that were described, while here they are better reflected. Of course, with the now, well, now with these new diffusion models, um, it might look a little bit different. And uh, finally, we can now get a scene graph. We can also get the image for a scene graph, but the question is, can we also apply modifications, basically? Can we use a scene graph to, to make changes to the initial image. And that's exactly what they did here. So as you can see here, you have this image, input image in the graph, and we now switch uh, the, the node or the, the, the attribute here from writing to, to next to, and, uh, and the, on the right, we see the respective output image, which now the woman is standing next to the, to the horse. And the problem here is that there is not really data for this task. 
So um, there's not really um, data where you have a scene graph and then you have the, uh, the corresponding output image where the change has been applied, but everything else stays the same. So how they trained this was in a more like an outgoing coder fashion. So they had the input image, they used some graph predictor or ground truth graph in this case to get an edge embedding in the node features. And then they used a similar approach than what we have seen before to go back from the graph to the image. And during training, they kept also um, dropping features for the node as well as for the uh, uh, like for the bounding box as well as for the for the visual representation and let the network basically fill those in and when you train that way in an out in code fashion the network is later on able to basically uh, do changes if it requires so if you done change like um, the, the content of the node and we mask this out we get the new uh, image with the change and here are a few examples for this. So they did object replacement, like changing the sheep to elephant, then um, also object removal. So simply dropping a note from the graph or also changing the relationship. So here we see the tennis example from right next to, but also like uh, sitting to standing can, can be done that way. Okay. With that, I pass it back to Federico. Okay, so uh, we've seen uh, how the, let's say, more image-based field has been quite um, active in trying to use scene graphs for, for both generating a scene graph on an image and vice versa, which means given a scene graph, generate an image in a, let's say, realistic way. So we can do, for example, image manipulation. So these concepts are actually more recently uh, inspired a lot the 3D uh, community in order to try to apply this on 3D data in particular 3D scene as we've seen before. Um, the extension is conceptually very simple. As we said before, the concept of scene graph can be easily changed or translated from images to 3D scenes. In the inner case, uh, it's typically, as we said before, objects and uh, relationship, geometric or semantic relationships, but everything else kind of stays the same, stays the same and we can use again the GCN approaches uh, that we described in order to make inference uh, on, 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 on 3D data. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk in this part in particular about the, the inference part and how we will finally conclude with the gener generative part. Um, the first one of the first works is actually related to also uh, contribute to a data set. So the, the community, of course, requires data sets where you have scene graph annotations. This is what was proposed with this 3D SSG work. Uh, in this case, um, the authors took a pre-presented, uh, pre-proposed, a previously proposed data set, which include 3D scenes with real changes over time, uh, semantically labeled, and applied annotation in terms of nodes. And so now you can have a variety of 3D scenes where you have annotations in terms of the graph, and also scenes that change over time with the same uh, graph basically uh, graph annotations are applied. This is particularly useful, for example, for the scene change application that I mentioned before. The um, inference algorithm itself is pretty uh, simple. The idea is to take 3D bounding boxes uh, around each of the semantically labeled objects and then apply a simple uh, 3D feature encoder. In this case, it was simply a point net. And this represents the initial feature that we associate to each of our nodes in the graph. For the edges or relationships instead, we do something similar, it's just that we uh, use a 3D bounding box that encloses both objects for which we want to compute the relationship. But they approach it the same, we compute the point net, and then this is the initial feature associated with that type of uh, edge. Then we run our GCN, as explained before, and this ends up with, uh, let's say, refined and improved labels for both the uh, nodes as well as the relationship. Um, these are some, some initial results uh, that were proposed. Now, the nice thing for the community is that there's a data set, there's a training set, there's a test set, and there's a set of metrics that can be used to, to compare. And there's already a few more recent works that have been used uh, that are now relying on this uh, frame set, framework and test bed in order to compare and improve the, the results. Um, in this work, they also uh, show, uh, let's say, some of the applications I mentioned before, for example, the multimodal or 2D to 3D scene retrieval. So we can use an input to the image or an input depth map in order to retrieve a, a scene from a set of uh, 3D um, scene database. Uh, I won't really go into the details for reasons of time, uh, but these are just some results where particularly particular metrics uh, specific for this type of 
seen graph inference, such as, for example, the Jacquard index, have been used to make the comparison, both in the 2D to 3D and in 3D to 3D case. Uh, another application that's somehow uh, mentioned in this, in this work is this in uh, change detection. As I said before, these annotations are based on a database where, where there are real changes across uh, time for the same scene. So if you have the possibility to uh, extract a scene graph in both cases, so before and after the changes, we can directly leverage the uh, changes in the scene graph to quickly detect those semantic uh, components that change, for example, because the, the node label changed, for example, a node, an object that got removed from the scene or the relationship. In this case, you can see, for example, a pillow that got moved away uh, and closer to a different uh, node or for example, for example, the chair. Uh, the data set is available and you're welcome to, uh, to have a look at that. Um, so we've seen so far how we can infer 3D, 3D scene graphs from a set of 3D reconstructions. This is, of course, uh, something that requires someone to first go into the scene and, uh, and scan our data, our, our scene with, with some sort of sensor. This is sometimes a little bit cumbersome. So one of the next uh, steps that was interesting to investigate is whether we can do this incrementally in real time from a sequence of data. Uh, in this case, we rely on a SLAM pipeline uh, that provides, an, uh, let's say that relies on an RGBD set of frames. And the idea is that while we use the SLAM approach in order to reconstruct our scene and extract the semantic components, we want to also incrementally extract the scene graph. Um, we can skip this, this slide. This is just a presentation of the work that was presented last year at CVPR. Uh, to briefly uh, introduce the method, first we incrementally build a 3D geometric segmentation from our RGB sequence. This is frame, frame by frame. And then for each of the geometric component, we associate a set of nodes and we build up a partial first version of our, of our graph. In this case, we also use the same um, encoding for the features. So we use point net for both the edges and the nodes. Um, then we apply the GNN or GCN exactly as we mentioned before. Um, in this case, of course, it's very important that this can run uh, particularly fast because we want to run this for every frame in a real time manner. Uh, the difference now with respect to what we've seen before is that this partial graph needs to be fused into a global 3D scene graph very quickly and very effectively. So you have to imagine that every frame in the sequence provided with a partial graph this is very partial because it's just a frame and how to basically fuse this together. One possibility or one, let's say, suggestion that comes from this work is to also include labels, such as, for example, part of. Since you're going to look at objects from different viewpoints, you're going to have multiple frames where the object is only partial. So part of uh, basically tells the network that there's going to be other viewpoints where the same object will be seen, and then you can uh, aggregate it together in the same object. This is just another qualitative result of this approach where you can see a, a sequence RGBD sequence and the incremental reconstruction that describes both the geometry of the scene, the semantic segmentation, as well as the semantic scene graph. And with this, I'll pass it over to Fabian for the fourth and last part of the story. Okay, so. Um... Now we have seen also how to get a, a scene graph from a, from a CD scene. So again, the question is, can we also generate the uh, corresponding 3D scene from a graph here? And um, so, so what we want to do here is we want to be able to, at least in this work, the authors wanted to be able to synthesize new scenes. They wanted also to be able to do just general completion. So we add a new object to the current scene or suggest new objects. So the input here was a floor plan and an empty or partial room, and then they propagate this room with these new objects. And they did not really use syngras, but it's still interesting to see. Um, but they used an unordered set of objects, which they then, um, which then added to, to the seed here. And this was done in an autoregressive form using a transformer, as we'll see in, a, in the next slide. So starting from, from a scene, which with a scene layout, and M objects, like you can see here in blue, uh, object one and so on, and the, in yellow, the, the scene layout. Um, features are extracting using a, a ResNet here, and uh, also from the, from the structure encoder for all the objects, like the class, inflation, rotation, and also scale properties. And then we have for each object a feature and also a query, which we feed to the transformer to, um, 
to predict some uh, some to get obtain some more high level features, and then um, with the uh, trainable query, we then impute the next object uh, that we want to add to the op uh, to the scene, and they do it in object recursive fashion. So they first predict the class of what object do we add, then where do we put it, like the position, location, because um, it should also fit to the kind of scene. So they do it in, in a step by step fashion. Uh, here's some qualitative results on when they train it with this 3D front. So the, the output, like, so the method was really able to uh, infer very nice 3D scenes. The thing is that we we have no control over this. Basically, we cannot really describe it. It just adds the next object to the scene in a way that makes of course sense. But it would be nice to. We were thinking it would be nice to also be able to control this. So in this work, what they did is they started to get it from a 3D scene graph. And they wanted to predict the layout or basically the whole city scene for image generation purposes. So um, they, they basically what they did, they went from this graph to the layout and then they do retrieval to get all the objects. They actually also did some refinement using differential per rendering and then they rendered more or less the output image. Uh, they started by, you know, you, you start from a graph, uh, the scene graph, and for each node, you basically feed um, the properties of, of the layout. So in this case, the boxes with, with the width, height, length, its position, and also its size. And then they use the variation graph of encoder to uh, embed it in a uh, latent space and then reconstruct it and having some uh, reconstruction loss at the end. And from this, they could use uh, from the from the distribution, from the Gaussian distribution that they obtained at the end, they could basically sample new scenes by sampling uh, from uh, sampling each node from this distribution and decoding it into the into the final layout. And as I said, then they use the diagonal of the bounding box to retrieve the objects for this scene. And if you have some qualitative uh, comparison with this paper from Thomson for the image generation. So you can see that given that they use this 3D layout or this 3D scene as an intermediate step, they get much more uh, nicer images at the end and, um, than the Thompson paper where the objects are very blurry and sometimes you don't see the borders. The problem here is that um, this is not end-to-end -end trainable. So we were wondering, can we make this all end-to-end -end trainable in a way that can we go from a graph directly to the final 3D scene? And <clears throat> And uh, of course, it should again follow the constraints of the graph. And in this case, like in this image work before, we also wanted to be able to apply modification or changes to the graph, and then the, the scene updates accordingly. So we, we start basically with a very similar approach from, from uh, out, a variation out encoder for, for this graph, but we add also uh, features for the shape of the object to the scene. And in this case, uh, we either use features from AtlasNet or from DeepSDF and enrich with this our scene graph. And then we ran both to an uh, encoder and then to some shared encoder to get this shared length and embedding. And uh, this we could then decode again into the shapes and the layouts to the final scene. And we had also this uh, manipulate the network, which directly works on the left hand codes. So, if, for instance, if you want to add an object, you just added a new node in the left hand graph sampled some noise to make uh, to allow basically always different scenes and then we ran into the decoder to, to apply these changes the thing is that for this task we unfortunately it's hard to evaluate it so the way we did it was that we we used uh, the method that was presented before for uh, scene graph generation um, as, a, as a proxy to, to evaluate so we, we first took the scene graph then we predicted the uh, constructed the respective scene and ran again the scene graph prediction network to get uh, to get the scene graph again from the scene and then compared it with the initial input and um, we could see that we could achieve better results using this shared embedding between shape and, and layout than just simply doing uh, one uh, one network for, for the whole scene as a distribution and method. And what was also very interesting is that our model was even able to consider the context of the scene. So here, uh, when, when, when I had a, a chair next to a desk, it always gave me an office chair most of the times. Um, but when I, for instance, tap or remove this connection or said it's, a, it's a, another table, it gave me just a normal chair. So the model was really able to understand the context. 
And here are a few more qualitative results. So the first one was with DSTF. Um, so we see the scene graph and the, and the generated scene. And also these uh, changes that, for instance, in the first one, we added a pillow. In the second one, we changed the, the size of the chairs. So now the, the red room becomes smaller. And uh, then we moved the table, uh, the TV to the side, or also added a cabinet to the bathroom. And um, with this, um, I want to already conclude and a little bit talk about future directions. So um, the scene graphs are, of course, also useful in other, in other ways when we are dealing with scenes. So what I wanted to very briefly mention is this holistic screen to scene understanding. So we are trying to do 3D object detection, but for this to basically use the scene graph to refine. So you get the initial uh, 3D object detections, the bounding boxes, you feed it to a scene graph, and then you use it to uh, refine the, the obtained 3D bounding boxes by making sure that there's no intersection, there's no violations of physics and other properties. And they also extended, uh, here's some qualitative results then, but they also extended this at the end to pan panoramic uh, 3D scenes, and it also works quite interestingly. Uh, with this, I'm actually already finishing. It's uh, what we can, what we saw today was still like very early first steps towards uh, 3D scene graphs in, in, in 3D vision. But now that we slowly getting data sets, we slowly getting first approaches. I think it's a, it's a very nice moment to to hop on the train and basically come up with new methods and evaluate it. And I think there's a lot of potential in the future. Thanks. Are there any questions? Can you please come uh, to the front? Can you please come to the front so that people in Zoom can also hear the question? Sorry. Can you please come to the front so the people in Zoom can also hear the question? Okay, so I don't think it's, it's, it's great actually that you work on this problem and, and invite the whole community to do so. Um, so I'm seeing these graphs as probably maybe not the most abstract, but definitely a very abstract representation of the scene. It doesn't contain, for instance, any geometric information about objects. But then there are very low level representations, just like the ones you used, like point clouds. Now, there are also in representations that are in between, probably, right? Uh, for instance, an oriented bounding box or uh, maybe a convex object, whatever. And so, I was wondering if you thought about the hierarchy of representation because here I see that you nicely use the point cloud and the scene graph together. Can you use as also all the representations that are in between in the same context? And I don't know, does it even make sense? Whoever. Maybe maybe I can take this. Uh, thanks for this uh, interesting question. <laughs> it's actually um, nice to see that graphs and scene graphs, they have enough flexibility to actually deal with uh, uh, also the level of, um, um, so the, the level of abstractness that we require for the representation of our scene. There's actually a few works, and this is also something interesting for us in terms of future work, that I already started exploring, for example, adding geometrical properties to a scene graph. So instead of just predicting or Let's say storing information such as, for example, um, similarity or um, semantic uh, affinity between between shape. Um, they also store the six of poles of the objects and their relationship. One nice thing is, is that you can also apply, for example, specific geometric contents in indoor scenes. Very often, for example, for the application that we've seen before, uh, it's very important to assume I don't know a Manhattan world where you have uh, walls that are um, orthogonal to each other into the floor. 
And uh, this is typically done by imposing geometric constraints directly on, for example, the coefficients of the planes that represent this, this, uh, these walls. With the scene graphs, we can now do it directly into the graphs. And it's a little bit up to us to decide, first of all, where we wanna uh, position ourselves in terms of at a very abstract stage or more in between geometry and semantics, or also uh, to decide what's the important characteristic that we wanna make use of in terms of our nodes and relationships. For example, if we wanna describe the geometric parts, as we said before, we wanna look into poses, we wanna look into this type of monotonous relationships. If instead we wanna make use of our scene and understand how a, I don't know, autonomous agent or even people will make use of this scene, then we will, for example, relate nodes to affordances or relate nodes to action that I can actually apply on our, on our objects. And by the way, this is all, um, let's say, um, yet to be explored. So everybody that's interested in this, uh, in these aspects, let's say, uh, you're, you're welcome, let's say, to start looking into this and start participating to this discussion with the interested parties in the community because it's still uh, all to be written, let's say. Are there any more questions? Yes. No question. <laughs> First of all, thanks for the talk. So, actually, I want to ask is this, uh, so there's another type of thing graphs more care about this uh, hierarchy structure in the building, like a room level and building level. And this thing graph is more care about relationship between objects. So I, I'm quite curious, like where, whether, uh, when these two types of things graph will met one day in the future. So I'm just curious, what, what was your thought about um, this will happen in the future or, or, or not? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, well, I, I believe that it's gonna happen very soon because you need this kind of abstract, like room level layout to basically understand where I'm locating. But you also need to have the understanding of how is my scene that, that, that I'm currently in. So also need this more like um, a scene as a graph as we described it, and in order to uh, uh, do like stuff like navigation within the scene, other other approaches. All right. Let's thank uh, both our speakers for the great talk. And now I would like to welcome uh, Judith Fan. She is an assistant professor of psychology in the University of California, San Diego. And today she will be talking about vision, uh, evaluating physical predictions from vision in human and machines. Uh, please uh, welcome uh, Judith. And give us a second to set up the presentation, please. I don't have a drive. Yeah.
to make it easier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then sound check. All right, sound check. Is your screen now shut? Yes. Okay, we can see here. Okay. Awesome. Great. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, it's really awesome to be here um, with you all this afternoon. Can we just move the things so Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, where's my cursor? Work. Okay, that's tolerable. Okay, <laughs> all right, um, excellent. Okay, so um, I'm super excited to be here. Um, and the very first thing I wanted to do was to acknowledge that this work uh, that I'll be sharing with you is a serious team effort by everyone on this slide. I want to offer a special shout out to all four co-first authors on this work for their fearless leadership, Dan Baer, Eli Wang, Damian Mirza, and Felix Binder. And a very, very special thanks to the co-PI major creative driver uh, behind this work, Dan Yamans. And my name is Judy Fan. I'm a cognitive scientist at UC San Diego, and I am really happy to be here and tell you about vision. So imagine that you're in a kitchen. Each of the objects that you push, lift, and pour behaves in ways that are characteristic of their physical properties. It's mass, shape, friction, elasticity, and so on. Although you and I might take for granted our ability to interact with the physical world around us, we as humans do have exquisitely well calibrated um, understanding of how the physical world works, an understanding that we can leverage to achieve our goals, um, including making amazing pizza. And a major goal that many of us here share is to develop AI systems that interact with the physical world as effectively as we do. But how would we know if an algorithm understood commonplace physics in a human-like way? And if it didn't, how could we hone in on the critical missing ingredients? What we need is a benchmark that first exposes understanding of how objects will behave over time. Second, covers a wide range of different physical phenomena and critically does so in rich and realistic environments that we think would transfer to the real world. Now, there are already several data sets out there that probe physical understanding to at least some extent, but they all fall short on at least one of these key dimensions. So at NeurIPS last year, we introduced a new data set, which we call Fission, that meets all three of these criteria. And the goal of my talk today is to tell you first what fission is and what we learned by using it. Next, I'll show you some tools that our team has developed to make it easier for you to use fission in your own work. And finally, I'll close by sharing with you where we're headed next um, towards tackling some of the major outstanding challenges at the intersection of computer vision, AI, and cognitive science. So, in our first fission paper, um, we made three contributions, 
a new benchmark data set containing diverse and realistic physical scenarios with complex object interactions. We proposed a unified evaluation protocol to evaluate physical understanding in models and humans. And we conducted systematic comparison of state-of-the-art models against human performance. The current release of Vision consists of movie clips featuring a wide range of physical phenomena across eight scenario types. In this work, we prioritize the foundational physical concepts that have previously been studied in cognitive science. So beginning with maybe one of the most widely used scenario types and studies of human physical prediction in 3D environments, um, it, it makes use of towers of precariously stacked blocks. These are scenarios we call support. These support scenarios are interesting because they probe understanding of physical stability, an abstract property of scenes that relies on understanding of how gravity and other forces act on objects. And then as part of Fission, we procedurally generated a large number of these scenarios using the 3D world simulator with different numbers of objects, different forces, and a variety of different visual contexts with, a, with large variation in textures um, with, and uh, backgrounds. The collide scenarios focus on projectile motion and collisions between two primary objects. In contained scenarios, you have to understand how well one object can contain another. In drop, the dynamics depend on how objects fall and bounce off one another. Then there's link, in which objects motion is weakly or strongly constrained by attachment to other objects. Roll and slide emphasizes the difference between rolling and sliding um, as a function of object shape. It also included dominoes, which measures understanding of spatial relations, momentum, and sequences of multiple collisions. And finally, drape includes cloth-like objects interacting with rigid objects under the effects of gravity. Now, with such a wide variety of scenario classes, it's not immediately obvious how to specify a task that is both well-defined across all of them and also natural for people to do, meaning the kinds of everyday physical prediction that's most relevant to human observers. And if you focus on only a single physical domain like block towers, there may be one especially salient property, um, such as their stability, and you can conduct all of your evaluations just using that one concept. But if you're looking at a ball about to roll down a ramp, being asked to judge whether the scenario is stable or not is a lot less informative about the specific dynamics of this scene. It's also worth specifying a physical prediction task that's actually natural for people to do, that they can easily understand and are capable of performing. While well, pixel level uh, next frame generation is generic, it is not at the appropriate level of abstraction to be a viable behavioral output for humans. On the other hand, eliciting high level event-based predictions is natural for people to do and report on. So to meet those two conditions, we developed the object contact prediction task. Object contact prediction task or the OCP task asked an agent to consider two objects with a special status, the agent and the patient, and then make a prediction based on the presence and kind of other objects and forces there are in the scene um, as to whether the agent will make contact with the patient. Now what's appealing about this task is that by varying those other objects and forces, it requires agents to accurately forecast how the various objects in the scene will physically interact with each other in a generic way. At the same time, the final judgment concerns whether a specific event will occur, making it a really natural way to probe human physical scene understanding. So here's what the task looked like to the human participants we recruited in order to provide a benchmark against which we could rigorously evaluate state-of-the-art models. The agent and patient objects were always pre-queued at the beginning of each trial, the flashing red and yellow masks, but otherwise were visually indistinguishable from the other objects in the scene. And then after the first few frames, 
and well before any objects could e even come into contact with the agent, people were asked to predict whether the key contact event would occur. Then for each of 150 videos in a given scenario type, we collected predictions from 100 different human participants. In parallel, we elicited predictions from 11 state-of-the-art models on exactly the same set of videos. And because these scenarios were procedurally generated in 3D world, these predictions could then be compared to the ground truth future states of the scene, allowing us to compute objective measures of performance for both humans and machine agents. We collected these predictions in parallel for all eight scenarios in our data set. And to be clear, this was a Herculean effort for our team and these human experiments were led by Felix Binder. So our next challenge was to develop a unified framework for training and evaluating physical understanding across models with vastly different architectures. We conceptualize each model as consisting of three modules. First, an encoder that takes an input. In the standard case, a series of RGB frames making up a video. The output of that encoder module feeds into a dynamics module that tries to predict the evolution of the state beyond the input frames. Note that the architecture of the dynamics module will vary depending on the format of the latent representation passed in by the encoder. For object-centric encoders, these were RNNs operating over graph-based representations, of special relevance to this tutorial. But for non-object-centric encoders, these were standard RNNs operating over tensor representations. And while all of our key vision model baselines operated directly over raw video inputs, we also included a particle uh, input bypass um, into the dynamic modules. Um, the reason why these particle input models are especially important and useful for experiments is that um, even though we are primarily interested in physical prediction from vision in this work, we are uh, really interested as researchers to disentangle limitations due to the encoder from limitations due to downstream modules, including the dynamics one. The third and final component was a readout module mapping the latent representation to a prediction about the scenario. So in this case, will the agent touch the patient? And then with this generic evaluation framework in hand, we surveyed the recent literature to obtain a diverse sample of publicly available models that each represented plausible hypotheses about how to achieve generalized physical prediction. Now we knew we couldn't conduct a comprehensive evaluation in this work, but we did prioritize including models that span a wide range of different architectures from more generic vision-based models like SVG to architectures with stronger object-centric inductive biases such as OP3, DPI, GNS, and RPIN. We also made sure to include models that varied in how they were trained. Some were supervised with ground truth object metadata like RPIN, and others self-supervised on pixel reconstruction like SVG. And we obtained several key results based on our parallel evaluations of models and people. So here I'm going to plot accuracy on the test set videos um, on the y-axis and all of the agents um, along the x on the x-axis marching from left to right. But before we go there, um, I want to mention that this work was a product of joint leadership by Eli Wang and Dan Baer with key contributions from Damian Mirza. So our first observation was that humans are good, but they are far from perfect at making predictions over these scenarios, averaging about 75% correct predictions. But as you can see with the little grayed out icons on this plot, there was also substantial variation across different scenario types. And given our sample size, we can be fairly sure that these estimates are highly reliable. Our second observation was that none of the computer vision models that we tested came close to human performance. Though some of these were significantly better than others, um, here the blue group over the red, models that received supervised or unsupervised training signals related to objects rather than simply predicting the future pixels of a movie 
seemed to achieve higher accuracy, which suggested to us that explicitly abstracting away from the pixel level may be really important for tasks like natural physical scene understanding. And that observation is consistent with another really key result from our experiments. Algorithms that take particle-based object meshes as input approach human level performance. Of course, these models solve a much easier problem than humans. They don't have to infer anything about physical state from visual inputs, but already have a rich, explicit, accurate scene description given to them directly. And since our goal was to identify candidate models that could not only perform well, but also behave in a human-like way, we also computed a measure of human model consistency, which I'm plotting on the right hand side of the slide. This tracks how similar the pattern of errors that were made by each model by comparison with the amount of variation within our human sample. So this analysis revealed a striking correspondence between performance, absolute performance, and consistency with humans. In other words, models that approached human level performance also made more human-like predictions. However, while some of the particle input models achieved human level accuracy, there remains a significant gap to close in order to achieve human-like physical prediction, as indicated by the flatter slope of the purple curve um, on the right. And taken together, these results suggest that a model's latent scene representation is critical to its prediction ability. And we think then that a crucial open problem in physical understanding is building models that learn to abstract out an explicit physical scene representation, perhaps a scene graph from pixel inputs. Okay. So far, I've told you about what problem the fission data set and benchmark was designed to solve and some of the preliminary insights that we've gained from conducting evaluations of current models and benchmarking them against human behavior. But I'm here at this tutorial to tell you that the evaluations we've done so far are just scratching the surface. Our real hope for fission is that it'll be a useful resource for the computer vision community here and AI community more broadly to help you and your colleagues benchmark your own or others' models and understand how well they are approximating human physical prediction. Okay, so here are some pointers to publicly accessible resources that we've created to uh, first remind you of key details about vision and our main findings. Um, we have a short blog post on our project website, um, as well as um, uh, one of our GitHub repos where you can easily download the full data set, including all videos and ground truth metadata about every 3D scenario um, at all time points. Um, and then third, uh, another repo containing the code we use to evaluate the models in our first paper, as well as some starter code to help you evaluate new models. So um, this is a quick scroll through of um, that site. So you'll know that you've come to the right place. It has lots of different um, um, key details here, as well as uh, additional um, example uh, videos if you scroll down to the bottom so you can get a, a, a better sense of the array of different um, physical interactions that are probed in our data set. And um, if you visit our uh, first repo, this contains um, the links to download um, what we're calling Fission Test Core. Um, which is all of the MP4s that you'd need to take a look at and see uh, the raw the, the raw inputs that we use to evaluate the models in the paper, but also um, that you're free to use however you wish. Um, and if you follow some of the links to uh, a second repo, this contains the code that we use to evaluate the models in our paper and also some um, additional uh, resources for for others. And if you go ahead and check out our code base and have feedback or questions, feel free to uh, post an issue or get in touch with me or any other members of the team. And we'd be happy to try to help, um, help you get through any of the um, areas where there could be friction. 
and um, also mentioned that these resources were initially developed um, by uh, Eli Wang as part of his PhD work now at Tesla, um, and they're currently being maintained by Rahul Binkatesh, a new member of the Fission team. Okay, so how can you use Fission in your own work? Of course, download our data set um, and our model training evaluation code to test, to test your own or others' models. Okay, finally, where do we go from here? Now, something that I left out from the earlier story is that there is a major open question raised by uh, fission that is of fundamental importance for understanding human visual intelligence. What is the role of forward simulation in explaining human physical prediction? So while there has been a lot of support for the hypothesis that people do use some kind of mental simulation in order to predict how states of the world will evolve over time, running a genuine internal model, a genuine world model um, to imagine future states, this hypothesis has actually been hotly contested in the field, with some arguing that uh, approximate heuristics play a much larger role. Um, you know, these kind of shortcuts play a much larger role for explaining most everyday intuitive physical judgments. You can see some of the pointers to some of the work that's uh, debated this issue. And as part of our vision evaluations, we took a stab at this very question by asking how much better models did when they generated their predictions based on the output of an internal simulation process modeled by the dynamics module versus when they only base their readout on uh, the latent representation for the initial input frames without any additional simulation of future states. So for SVG on this plot, that would be the difference between the circle and the square. And we actually don't see an advantage for using the output of simulation relative to just using the initial frames. And SVG was not the exception. We didn't see a simulation-based advantage for any of the other uh, vision models we tested. Um, but critically, we do see a boost when these models are shown the full movies, indicating that these features are useful for exploiting features of the input to detect object contact events, even if they don't support strong prediction. But these results also raise the possibility that the main way that these vision models are able to get off of chance is driven by the visual features available from the initial frames of the video, like object position, shape, and contact relationships that basically gave away what the final outcome would be. And to some extent, those kinds of shortcuts may be unavoidable for the types of rigid body scenarios that we tested, however diverse they were. So our next step is to um, upgrade uh, fission in various ways. Um, and this new release will at a minimum contain scenarios featuring variation in latent physical properties that cannot be directly inferred from a single frame, but only by tracking how objects interact over time including variation in a much broader array of non-rigid materials, including bounciness, as demonstrated here. And here are some more early demos from Vision 2.0, which will include greater variation in mass, friction, viscosity, bounciness, again, deformability, and more. We're also very welcome to taking ideas for additional physical properties that you think would be really useful to have as part of this more comprehensive benchmark. This new work is being led by Fish Tung, a, a postdoc on our team. Vision 2.0, in addition to including more materials um, and be more challenging for physical understanding, uh, and that way, we'll also generalize beyond the base OCP task to include large scale human psychophysical measurements of other aspects of human scene understanding, including uncertainty, providing an even richer target for models to capture. And the final idea 
I'd like to leave you all with is that you can think of fission as just one instantiation of a larger enterprise that my collaborators and I call Cognitive AI Benchmarking, or CAB for short. CAB is not business as usual in AI or in cognitive science. It brings together the study of human cognition with the design of new algorithms and the engineering of realistic virtual environments in a virtuous cycle. And this is the kind of multidisciplinary teamwork that we think will really pay off in the long run. And in short, CAB, what distinguishes CAB is, um, is that it aims to conduct rigorous measurements of natural human behaviors, think exploration, communication, collaboration, planning in realistic environments in order to reveal the size and shape of AI human gaps today. And thus, the opportunities, the specific opportunities for next generation AI systems to fill. Okay, with that, the end and thank everyone else on the vision team once more, as well as um, our generous uh, sources of funding. Thank you. Looks like you have plenty of time for questions. I can repeat the question. Oh, yes. Can you comment about the relation between CAM and Fusion with Brainstorm Benchmark? Yeah, absolutely. I can repeat the question. Yeah. So the question was, how um, can I uh, talk a little bit about how CAB relates to Brainscore? Um, thanks for your question. So Brainscore is a leaderboard um, that uh, measures how well different vision algorithms perform in predicting primate neural data. So the target for explanation there is uh, the result of neurophysiology experiments performed in primates, um, including humans as well, I think. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's meant as a way of building consensus across the AI and neuroscience um, and cognitive science communities for that matter, with respect to what the targets are and how close we are to achieving them. So CAB has a very like, uh, it's, it's quite inspired by projects like BrainScore, I think. The goal is to bring a fair amount of discipline and a sense of, I suppose, team spirit to the study of these kinds of behaviors. So for neural data, BrainScore would be a, like a, a good tool for that. For these kinds of higher level, cognitive phenomena, including physical understanding, exploration, natural communication. There are a variety of different data sets out there um, um, that you can use to train or evaluate various models in parallel in cognitive science. There are a variety of what, what we call stimuli and experimental task paradigms where you might test some of those behaviors, but not often in tandem and in parallel in such a way they can be directly and quantitatively uh, compared to one another. So one, one key distinction is the focus on rich behaviors as opposed to neural data, but there's a quite close kinship with projects like BrainScore insofar as they're about organizing uh, the community and rallying the community around particular you know, benchmarks and putting in the elbow grease to, to uh, build comprehensive enough ones that they would be convincing to the community as a whole. Um, and I would say that um, unlike uh, other recent work that has um, amassed large human data, so I'll you know, mention that human behavioral data that accompanies the kinds of image sets we're used to working with in computer vision are also expensive, but worthwhile to collect if your goal is to build human level and human-like AI. And CAB is very much dedicated to putting resources towards collecting high quality human psychophysical data of that kind. And so really identifying core, a core suite of human behaviors that are natural for people to do that are still difficult for current AI systems to perform, and that we also think are likely candidates to push AI forward 
are good candidates for inclusion in CAP. That was a lengthy answer to a simple question. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I think you addressed this a bit in Vision 2.0, but I'm curious to what extent you think there may be biases in the data set that the model could pick up on, but a human can't. So at the very beginning, you showed like what I assume to be a brick falling on a bowl, and then the bowl actually balances, and I, I almost felt fooled. And I'm curious like to what extent. I made an assumption about the mass of that object that I think the model may have been able to make that I wasn't. I'm just curious, like, what extent you think that exists in the data? Thank you. That's such a rich and interesting question. It's something that we're wrestling with an ongoing, an ongoing data set design, as you can imagine. So um, let me try to unpack that. So one piece of it is, you know, are there priors that are human observers are bringing to the experiment that models aren't. Almost certainly, because people are trained, if you will, on a wide variety of different tasks, if you will, on much more diverse data. And they're actually gen they're generalizing to this set of toy objects in these settings. Um, the models are trained however they're trained, um, you know, and then basically adapted for only for the purpose of evaluation. This is not intended to be a, a a test suite, uh, sorry, a training data set, but rather a test set um, to, to, to study transfer learning. And, you know, there's, there are some interesting cases where there are aspects of human priors that are quite interesting and worth unpacking. For example, you can make inferences about materials, like based on the surface texture of certain materials, guesses about how heavy an object is or its density um, in, trying to control for that, we opted for mostly wood-based textures in this current release, but we're planning to uh, introduce uh, more diversity along that dimension in future releases, which could be disruptive for people, but also be an interesting way of studying visual adaptation on the part of people who can learn to infer um, the uh, properties of objects after observing them interact with some. So one other aspect of Vision 2.0 that I didn't mention is that even if there's a, even if an object is surprisingly light or surprisingly heavy based on what you've inferred from its texture, you might see that it, you know, um, it was knocked over really easily. And then so when you see it land against something else that you also think is really light, but it fails to move it, you may be less surprised. And so for those more extended kind of natural interactions over time, we're really interested in how people build up from online observation, a working hypothesis about these latent physical properties that may not be entirely given away by knowing their label or other kind of abstract, you know, semantic information that they have. Um, there are, of course, you know, uh, other reasons why some of these videos might look a little bit weird. And if you download our test set, you'll find them. We've included a README with um, uh, the uh, file names for those videos already um, uh, tagged. So um, there are some that we've been calling adversarial cases. They're ones that are so weird that um, our sample of human participants consistently got them wrong and the physics in them looks really, really strange. <laughs> so on the one hand, this, is, this, could, this, is, um, this could be a limitation of our simulator, which is something that involves like some engineering to work out until it approximates physical realism better. That's one tack you could take. Another tack that I think is very interesting um, from the perspective, if you're interested in, for example, continual learning, is that we, of course, generalize to new virtual worlds with different physics when we play video games and when we go to different environments, say underwater or into outer space. And there's a really deep question about how we, as primates who evolved to move around on the surface of the planet, have managed to adapt to a wide range of physical environments, including ones with unfamiliar kinds of physics. And I think asking those questions about generalization 
um, can also be a really, really interesting direction to go in thinking about what we would want, um, what we would want from more adaptive AI systems, not only saw the world the way that we do, but also learned to see the world the way that people do across the lifespan. Yes. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just interested in how, uh, what do you think about how humans represent uh, these uh, 3D dynamics? Because uh, linking back to the scene graph from the last talk, I think it'll be really difficult for scene graphs to model these kind of deformation or liquid like viscosity, et cetera. But also it would not really generalize if you're planning in image space, I would imagine. So uh, what would you think is a good representation for humans to be able to plan or model future dynamics? Thank you for your question. Right, so um, I mentioned briefly um, when, when uh, describing Vision 2.0 that we plan to include additional readouts. So one readout that we've started with is the base um, binary judgment about contact. Um, in, the, in the future, I think what we really want is a suite of different behavioral readouts that encompass physical scene understanding at multiple levels of abstraction. I actually don't think there's going to be one single way that humans represent 3D scene dynamics in all scenarios. There may be some that may be more core and computed automatically, even without conscious awareness. And those are good candidates, I think, for places to start. Um, but there, and, and even for those problems, thinking about like object level abstractions as well as event-like abstractions could be really critical for capturing human level and human-like physical understanding and you know, approximating the level of like the kinds of confusions that people have. Um, but we also think that um, in addition to these more like quasi-linguistic descriptors of, well, we've already kind of imbued our OCP task with a little bit of semantics, right? We're like using kind of proto, these a particular kind of abstraction, if you will, that it can also be picked out by language. Right, namely naming the occurrence of a particular event, right? And we think of those as being really important. They're important enough that they've been encoded into the way that we talk to each other. But there are also ways in which you move about the world and predict how objects behave and, you know, and you know, intercept objects um, uh, that don't necessarily have easy, uh, you know, that we haven't necessarily baked into our vocabulary. So when you're like playing sports and you're thinking about all the various ways in which you can move a tennis racket, a lot of them are really hard to describe and much easier to show through demonstration. So another set of tasks that we think would be really powerful to augment this existing benchmark with is tasks that involve like online interception and more continuous kinds of prediction to accompany these somewhat more semantic kinds of readouts that we have started with anyway. And which ones are relevant may depend a lot on context, especially for people. All right, thank you very much, Judith. One more round of applause, please. Great test. <laughs>
All right. So finally, we have a talk from Luca Carloni and Rajat Dalak. Uh, Luca is an associate professor in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a PI in the MIT Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems, as well as the director of the MIT Spark Lab. Uh, Rajat is a postdoc associate at the Spark Lab with Luca, and he completed his PhD in the field of network autonomy from MIT. Please give a round of applause for both. Great, Grau. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me. You can see my screen. Yes? You can see your screen. OK. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And thanks for putting together such a nice tutorial. I attended the entire event. Like, you know, was uh, was very, very interesting. So thanks for, uh, for the effort. Um, I'm Luca Carlone. I'm an associate professor at MIT. Uh, and today, I'm going to share this presentation with Rajat Talak, uh, who is a postdoc in my group. In particular, today we're going to tell you about uh, hierarchical 3D scene understanding for robotics and to draw connections with graph neural networks. This, by the way, is also working in collaboration with the uh, students in my group that you see on the slide, Nathan, Yoon, C, and Lisa. Okay, so um, I will start by saying that high level 3D scene understanding is a grand challenge for robotics. It is about designing algorithms and systems that allow a robot to use sensor data to understand the geometry, semantics, and relation among elements in a 3D scene. 3D scene understanding is crucial for a robot to pass and execute high-level commands from a human. For instance, if I want to ask a robot, robot, go grab me the cup of coffee on the table in the kitchen, in order to pass and execute this instruction, the robot will have, we need to have some information about geometry. We need to know, for example, where is the kitchen? We need to know about semantics, right? We need to know what is a cup of coffee. And we'll also need to pass relations. What does it mean for a cup of coffee to be on the table and for the table to be in the kitchen? So high-level 3D scene understanding is key to interaction. Not only that, 3D scene understanding is also key to robustness. In particular, when we parse a scene as humans, we do not parse objects in isolations, but we reason over the context and relation between nearby objects. For instance, in this image, we understand that this one is not a physical car, is a, is a car which is painted on a billboard. And this is because we reason holistically over the scene and we can understand the relation between this part of the scene and the surrounding elements. This instead is a problem for real robotics application where the lack of scene understanding, or if you want the lack of common sense leads to perception failures. If you don't believe me, you can easily like, you know, find a couple of examples from self-driving cars with failures of current perception systems. This is a fairly recent one, is a Tesla autopilot. And uh, you can see at the beginning of the video that uh, there are a set of traffic lights on top of the truck. The perception system of the Tesla vehicle in this case fails to reason over the relation between the traffic lights and the truck, which leads to an incorrect interpretation of the scene. Therefore, our work here uh, addresses the question, can we develop algorithms and perception systems that allow our robot to understand 3D scenes, including geometry, semantics, and relations? So today I'm going, I'm going to argue that uh, 3D scene graphs are a particularly effective representation for 3D scene understanding. In particular, in the first part of the talk, I'll present our definition of 3D scene graphs, and I will introduce real-time algorithms that are able to create the different layers of a 3D scene graph. That's the work on the left. And then I will pass it to Rajat, who is going to tell you about how to use graph neural networks to perform inference over 3D scene graphs. And Rajat is also going to introduce this idea of neural trees. So let's get started with the idea of 3D scene graphs. So what are 3D scene graphs? Actually, this definition you will see is slightly different from the definition that you have seen in previous presentation. 3D scene graphs are nothing else than new map representation for robotics. In particular, a 3D scene graph is a hierarchical model where at the bottom there is a 3D mesh with semantic annotation. So you see the 3D mesh. Each phase of the mesh comes with a different color, which corresponds to a different semantic label. And if you go up in the layers, if you go up in this hierarchy, you essentially abstract away the mesh into high-level semantic concepts, such as objects and agents, 
places and structures, rooms, buildings, and so on. So many of these layers are pretty easy to understand, right? You know what is a room, you know what is a building, you know what are the objects. Uh, the only thing, the only layer that requires a little bit of an extra explanation is layer three, which is the layers of places and structures. So structures are just the walls, ceiling, and ground within an indoor building. Instead, places are uh, obstacle-free locations the robot can go to. So imagine that you have a graph of places in which each node in this graph is a location the robot can reach, and edges represent traversability within different locations. In other words, in other words, places are just a representation for the free space in the environment. So more formal, uh, a 3D scene graph is a directed graph where nodes correspond to spatial concepts, which is really anything living in 3D, and edges represent spatio-temporal relations between concepts. For example, agent I is in room J at time T. The reason why we believe that this representation is very powerful for robotics uh, is threefold. First of all, we can uh, represent through the edges in this scene graph, we can represent relations. And we have already seen in previous talks how pow powerful is to represent relations within elements in the scene. Second, 3D scene graphs, our definition of 3D scene graphs is really unifying a lot of different map representations for robotics. For example, the 3D mesh is what is called a metric map in robotics. Layer two, the objects correspond to what is called a landmark base map in robotics. And the graph of places is what is called a topological map in robotics. So now you have all these representation uh, unified in a single model, in a single 3D scene graph model. And finally, of course, this 3D scene graph includes actionable information for planning and decision making. Now the robot knows about rooms, objects, and relations, therefore can understand and execute high-level commands such as go to the kitchen and grab me a cup of coffee, for instance. So uh, let me contextualize a little bit our model among some related work, including those that we have seen today. Uh, first of all, we have to realize that uh, the idea of hierarchical maps is not new in robotics. And even in uh, early works, uh, you can see a lot of discussion about how to combine topological and metric maps. However, this representation, including the spatial semantic hierarchy that you see on the left, essentially were pro proposed very early on, like you know, 2000 or even before then. So they are missing the rich semantics we can now afford with deep learning. If you look at the second work, that's the scene graph, the original scene graph paper uh, by uh, Iro Armen. So this representation is quite similar to ours, but is missing key layers that we need in robotics. For example, the places layer, which is something we use for robot navigation is not there. Moreover, the focus for uh, this original scene graph paper was more about visualization and offline construction of the scene graph. Instead, we're shooting for building these representations in real time on a robot. Uh, third line of work, uh, there is a lot of work, recent work in robotics about uh, proposing other representations which are combining geometry, semantics, and relation. But again, this means high level semantics such as rooms, buildings, and so on. And finally, we've seen today the excellent work from the, from the group of uh, Federico and collaborators, which also targets real-time construction of scene graphs, but is focusing on objects and relations. And in a sense, our work is very complementary to theirs, uh, in the sense that we focus on simpler relations somehow, but uh, at the same time, we put more emphasis on the construction of rooms, buildings, and deconstructing the topology of the environment for uh, robot navigation. So what I want to do next is to tell you a little bit about the algorithms we use to, uh, to reconstruct 3D scene graphs. And I will start from uh, early contribution for the uh, first system that we provided to construct 3D scene graphs, which is called Chimera DSG. Chimera DSG stands for dynamic scene graphs. So Chimera DSG is taking input data from uh, you know, just a standard camera and inertial sensors, and is building layer one, which is the metric semantic mesh using Chimera, which is an open source library that we proposed uh, this open source library is essentially taking camera images into the semantic segmentations, and in real time is transforming these camera images into a 3D metric semantic mesh, which is a 3D model where each phase of the mesh, again, is color coded by a semantic label. So that's layer one. Um, on top of uh, Chimera, uh, what we do is to extract different objects. So after we have this metric semantic mesh, we uh, extract the different objects in the mesh, which at this point is quite easy. We just, for example, isolate the vertices in the mesh, 
corresponding to uh, the, the label chair. And we can just isolate these vertices, do some Euclidean clustering and fit a bonding box. Or if you have a CAD model, we can even fit a CAD model to the different objects in the scene. And that's layer two, which includes the objects. Then what we can do is reconstruct layer three and four, which are the places and rooms. So what we do here is to reconstruct a volumetric representation of the map and uh, extract a graph of places and the corresponding rooms by computing what is called a generalized Voronoi diagram. So if you're not familiar with this term, we just essentially just extract a skeleton of the voxel-based representation, which is called a generalized Voronoi diagram, and we convert that into a graph uh, describing the topology of the environment. And then we segment out this graph into different rooms. In our original proposal for Chimera DSG, we we're even able to uh, extract dense meshes of humans moving in front of the camera. So while building the map representation, we could extract and track and track these uh, dense models of, uh, of humans in the environment. So with Chimera DSG, we could do pretty fancy reconstructions of large scale environments as the one that you see over here. But there was a catch. The catch is that uh, the reconstruction that you see took around 30 minutes to reconstruct, which in robotics is not very useful. We like something that is understanding the environment in real time. And uh, in particular, what happened is that uh, the extraction of the places layer and the rooms required building a monolithic voxel-based representation of the entire environment, which made things very slow. And more importantly, since the trajectory and the mesh change after what is called loop closure, uh, after the robot is making loop closures, this approach will need to rebuild the scene graph after every loop closure, which is again impractical. So today I'm happy to introduce Hydra, which is uh, a perception system, a new perception system that we proposed. It's going to be presented at uh, RSS next week that can build a hierarchical 3D scene graph from sensor data in real time. So you see in the video that the robot is starting in a completely unknown environment, is incrementally building this uh, 3D metric semantic mesh, is reconstructing its own trajectory, is populating the graph of uh, objects in the environment, is extracting a topological map of places, which again form a skeleton of the environment, and then clustering this graph of places into rooms and buildings. So there are several insights behind Hydra. Uh, first of all, uh, what we did is to realize that extracting a topological map, we can extract a topological map of the environment on the fly, during mapping, instead of post-processing a monolithic voxel-based representation as in Chimera. So in hindsight, we realized that the topological map is something that we can get from free, for free uh, when doing mapping and reconstructing the 3D mesh. Second, we can reconstruct the graph of places uh, and we can segment the graph of places into rooms just by fast community detection methods, which are treating uh, the graph of places uh, as a graph and doing clustering on this graph to isolate the different rooms. And in hindsight, we realized that uh, we never need to create a monolithic voxel-based map of the environment, which again would be incompatible with long-term operation. So this slide shows an example of Hydra running on a real data set and uh, building a 3D scene graph. Uh, at the top left, you should see the images collected by the robot. These are 2D semantic segmentation produced by a standard uh, 2D pixel-wise segmentation network. And then you get the 3D scene graph and the corresponding top view of the scene graph. And the slide also mentions two unique features of Hydra. Uh, first of all, since we have a scene graph in the RSS paper, we also show that we can define hierarchical descriptors, descriptors for loop closure detection. Intuitively, these descriptors can inform loop closure detection with information about other layers in the scene graph, including rooms, objects, places, and topology making loop closure detection much more effective. Moreover, we developed a technique to simultaneously deform all the layers of a scene graph uh, in response to loop closures. So we are able to correct for drift and enforce loop closures by doing a single optimization over the scene graph. So let me play this video again because there is a lot of information here to unpack. Imagine that the robot is starting on the first floor of this building, then it's going up to the second floor, is uh, moving across the second floor, and you can see um, just visually that uh, the room segmentation roughly is making sense, right? These places in blue are one room, the other places in uh, green are another room. But you can also see that as the robot goes, uh, the trajectory estimate is accumulating a little bit of drift, right? So the map reconstruction is drifting, which can be also seen in the top view 
image. At the same time, when the robot is coming back to the original location, there is a loop closure. And with this 3D scene graph optimization, we can correct in a single optimization run the entire uh, 3D scene graph, which is pretty cool. So um, of course, like, you know, this is a robot, uh, talking about robotics application. We also, we are also in the process of testing Hydra on real robots, uh, running on board on real robots. So these are preliminary experiments we did with the uh, Unity A1, which is this guy at the bottom left. Again, you see the images from the robot, uh, segmentation from a standard network, and the corresponding scene graph being created in real time. These are very preliminary results. That's probably the first test we did with this robot. But uh, a couple of things that you can notice is that uh, um, even though the segmentation is not great, the overall reconstruction of the map, the 3D metric semantic mesh is pretty accurate. We can get a nice reconstruction of the trajectory. And overall, the segmentation into rooms is uh, is kind of is, is hard to judge, to be honest. But at least, like you know, the approach is doing something in this early test. I think the most encouraging bit of this slide, more than the reconstruction that can be largely improved, is the timing result that you see at the bottom right. This is the timing it takes to construct the scene graph uh, on Xavier and X, which is an embedded computer. And you can see that you can reconstruct the graph of places, uh, objects, and rooms in a matter of milliseconds. So this is something that we can easily implement. Uh, we can implement right now on a robot. Um, before passing it to Rajat, it's worth mentioning that 3D scene graphs provide incredible challenges and opportunities. Uh, for instance, the hierarchical structure of 3D scene graphs allows speeding up planning. In particular, on the left, we've been showing in our IGWR paper that we can use scene graphs to speed up planning by two or three orders of magnitude as compared to planning over voxels. Second, we've been showing that we can use uh, uh, graph neural networks and that uh, graph representations such as 3D scene graphs open the door to high-level reasonings um, and reasoning over high-level semantics. For instance, as humans, we can easily infer which type of room we are in by observing the objects within the room. For example, here, if the objects are bed, book, clock, and so on, we can easily infer that the corresponding room is probably a bedroom. Herachat is going to tell you that we can do pretty much the same thing for our robots using a graph neural network. And finally, we have initial evidence that uh, we have been presented at TICRA a few weeks ago that high level representations such as uh, uh, 3D scene graphs can also boost performance in reinforcement learning based uh, navigation. And of course, there are many, many other applications such as monitoring, prediction, long term autonomy, and so on. So now I'll pass it to Rajat, who's going to tell you about uh, the work we've done in connecting 3D scene graphs with probabilistic graphical models in graph neural networks. And he will introduce this idea of uh, neural trees. So let me stop the screen share. And uh, Rajat, the floor is yours. can see the slide, we cannot hear you yet. Now we can see you, but we cannot hear you yet. <laughs> Hello. Now it's getting better. Try to speak. No. Okay. Does this work? Yes. All right. All right. Okay. And remember to share again. Share the screen again. Yeah, I'll share the screen. And there's some problem with the audio. Okay. 
So sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, Luca discussed about uh, how uh, we have a system now, which is Hydra, which helps us build uh, 3D scene graphs in real time. Um, but there are some issues that we encountered because uh, these scene graphs are built in real time and in real world, uh, they're not necessarily always correct. So uh, in the, the remaining part, what we'll discuss is how we can maybe uh, come up with some learning based models that can help us, that can help correct uh, some of the mistakes that the uh, Hydra or real time uh, 3D scene graph construction pipeline makes and neural tree is one of the architectures that we propose but in general we would like to sort of come up with a, a discipline criteria discipline criteria so as to say which model is a better model for uh, uh, correcting and learning over these 3d scene graphs and gnn is a natural fit but what more than a gn what sort of criteria should the GNN uh, satisfy? How should we characterize expressivity, expressivity of uh, such graph neural networks? Uh, so that is the uh, uh, thing that I'll tackle for the remaining part of uh, the talk. Yeah. So, so errors in real-time 3D hierarchical construction. So when you when you run this pipeline, you you because it's run on the real world uh, uh, data, uh, you end up getting uh, few errors. So one one is like you can get uh, some of the node labels uh, incorrect, and because uh, your uh, uh, initial segmentation or object detection didn't work, and that error will filter all the way up to the scene graphs. You may have missing nodes because a robot traverses in the environment. It may miss to see a certain object correctly or uh, with like enough degrees. And so that will again percolate upwards to. Uh, having a missing node in the scene graph. You can have issues where uh, two objects get mistakenly clustered into one. Uh, this happens if you have like a rose, low resolution of points when building a mesh. So if you have like small uh, teacups sitting on a table very next to each other, they may get clustered into one. Uh, you can also have incorrect assignment of objects into rooms uh, because of uh, the hyperparameter for say the clustering algorithm not being set correctly, uh, missing rooms and building labels because the robot doesn't understand uh, like a semantic information and many more. So what we need uh, uh, going ahead is like having uh, is uh, a learning based model which you, uh, which takes in this 3D scene graphs uh, with errors and outputs a more corrected and a more complete uh, 3D uh, DSG. So, uh, and the, and what we'd like to think about first is what should the learning model do? And one thing that we are sure of that it, what it should do is like it should enforce some sort of semantic constraints that a human uh, sort of naturally knows. So for example, if you're told that a certain room is a bedroom, then it's very likely that it has a bed or a kitchen very likely has a refrigerator or say if you're, if you're given a area in a room which has like a desk chair, computer and a lamp, you probably can say that it's most likely a study area. Um, but the, uh, more than just these univariate constraints, there are also like graph-like constraints. So let's say you have this uh, uh, figure uh, with, uh, uh, let's say you have the scene where you know these bunch of few green labeled objects are chairs, but you don't know all the others. But because of the arrangements and the positions of the objects, you can sort of guess that the middle object should be a table and the other remaining object should be a chair, should be chairs. Uh, as well as for say, this is, um, a plan of a uh, apartment and you know all these other regions what they are say a bedroom a laundry a kitchen then you can probably guess that the remaining two have have to be a living room and a, a bathroom and probably the smaller one is the bathroom so uh, so this is another uh, instance where a graph like constraint rather than just a simple univariate univ constraint come in handy similarly the exploiting the hierarchical nature in the graphs so if you're given another say a floor plan of say a level two of an office building and if you're told that these are various office cabins then because this is an office building you can sort of deduce that the uh, internal structure inside every office building should look should be almost the same um, so and uh, so, the, so these are the constraints that the uh, learning model should enforce. And uh, GNN seems like an appropriate 
uh, model because it can induce uh, correlation across uh, different nodes uh, in the graph uh, because of the uh, iterative message passing uh, that it has. So, so what we need is a graph neural network based model that can for such semantic constraints. Now, uh, these semantic constraints are obviously available in training data, and that is where the graph neural network model sh should be would be would learn them from. So, an expressive enough graph neural network model should, uh, at a high level, should be able to seep in all these semantic constraints and correlations from training data. So, now to make this more uh, concrete we probably have to like go a little more deeply deeply into what how, how can we maybe mathematically write down what the semantic constraints and correlations may be um, so how do we think of these semantic constraints and uh, one way to do it and probably the only way to do it um, uh, because uh, 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 yeah, I don't know anything else. So, the, so one way to do it is like uh, inducing a probability distribution. Uh, so, say for example, you can say what the probability of bed is given a bedroom, and you can regress um, in the from the training data what this quantity might look like. And same way for say what the probability that uh, you classify some area as a study area, given that it has a desk, chair, computer, and la and a lamp. Um, but uh, and you can extend this to say graph graph constraints using what are called factor graph models. So factor graph models are basically probability distributions on graphs where every node uh, in the graph is associated with a variable, and then there are factor nodes which sort of determine which nodes are which other nodes are correlated. So you have a potential function defined for every factor, and the joint probability distribution is given by a product of all those potentials. And there are more than one way of writing. Uh, uh, an arrangement or a correlation uh, in terms of factor graphs, depending on how, how much correlation you want to capture. Now, the 3D scene graphs that uh, we have, uh, we can pr we propose like we, uh, the simplest way you can do it is by modeling them as a uh, undirected graphical models. Uh, so you have so in the undirected graphical models, unlike in the factor graph, uh, 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 the undirected graphical models dictate that the factors be the uh, graph cliques rather than something uh, so some separate nodes that are constructed. So in this case, so for example, uh, this would be a clique. So there'll be a potential function for each for this clique, uh, and so for every other clique. So for three D uh, scene graphs or the hierarchical scene graphs that we have, so you'll have a bunch of cliques that go from building. And a bunch of room, a building node, and a bunch of room nodes, and a room node, and a bunch of object nodes, and so on. So the joint probability distribution could be given by something that looks like this. And so this is what we would like to learn. So these are the correlations that we would like to, uh, like our uh, graph neural network model to learn. So what we say is, uh, expressivity. We uh, we define it as the ability to approximate any such function. And we make a slight tweak for mathematical convenience is that by we replace the multiplication with a summation. But you just take a log and you can uh, log of the probability and you get this function, which we call a graph compatible function. So uh, if a graph neural network on a graph is able to approximate any graph compatible function, uh, we call it uh, 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 an expressive architecture. Okay, so so how to build this? Uh, now there are uh, now probabilistic graphical models are pretty old and they've been used uh, quite extensively and where the state of the art uh, in many cases till the deep learning uh, methods arrived. And one of the uh, methods to solve this uh, was the loopy belief propagation. So the loopy belief propagation worked as if uh, like you posited uh, initial belief and uh, some message that you pass from one node to the other and you iteratively updated the beliefs uh, and the messages um, by some equation so for example the message you would update by the belief at one of the edges one of the nodes and the previous message and the belief in the next iteration you would update by aggregating all the messages that are incoming to it now this seems very similar to uh, what a graph neural network is and so it is. So if you just think of neuralizing this, like in the sense, like replacing this function with a more generic f that could be modeled as a neural network, and same way for this g, um, then this uh, looks very similar to what is known as like message passing neural network. And we know the explicitity, and there's an interesting parallel between the these two, uh, and that is um, the uh, expressivity of this is limited by two WL tests. 
That is, it, it can distinguish uh, between non-isomorphic uh, trees, but not any graphs. And loopy belief propagation is also not known to be op is known to be not optimal for inference on general graph except on trees. So there seems to be some nice parallel between the two. Uh, and uh, what uh, uh, inference models on uh, uh, inference on algorithms on probabilistic graphical models have uh, led to is like instead uh, is a what is known as junction tree algorithm, where instead of doing message passing on the original graph, you convert it into a tree graph where each node in the tree represents a clique, uh, in uh, a clique or a bunch of nodes in the original graph, and you do message passing on this. So the idea then is like if loopy belief propagation is sort of parallel to a message passing neural network or a graph neural network on uh, the original graph, then can we extract a uh, similar parallel with the junction tree algorithm and get a more expressive architecture. And that is exactly what we do and it's the idea behind neural tree architecture. Um, so we, so for the given input graph, we construct what is called an H tree. Now H tree is different from the junction tree. Uh, we uh, construct the H tree by successive tree decomposition. So we get a hierarchy of features uh, rather than just one uh, uh, level of hierarchy in the normal tree decomposition and we propose that you do message passing on this. So I don't have time to go through all the uh, construction results, but what we show is like uh, 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 the expressivity claim that uh, uh, given any graph compatible function, uh, the neural tree model is able to approximate uh, to any arbitrary precision. And uh, there's a uh, nice uh, complexity claim that we have that it's uh, the uh, number of parameters that you need to approximate grows exponentially in the graph tree width. Uh, and graph tree width is another parameter that shows up in many combinatorial optimization problems, including in the graph isomorphism, which many people in graph neural network have also considered. Okay, so. Uh, so uh, just showing one uh, piece of result as to what the uh, neural tree is able to do. Uh, um, so we uh, took this 3D scene graph data set, which is a nice data set provided by Stanford and Berkeley, people in Stanford and Berkeley. And we ran sale on uh, multiple um, standard graph message passing on the original graph and on neural tree. And what you observe is as you give it more uh, training data, um, the prediction accuracy increases. So that is the new, the explicitity of neural tree is high, but it's able to show it only if it has like enough training data to learn the, all the correlations. Whereas the, um, uh, whereas for classical uh, graph neural network message passing, the uh, average accuracy start begins to uh, taper off. Uh, so I guess I'll end here because it's like five minutes and open for question. Uh, but um, I hand over to Luca if he has like the final slide. Hello. Okay. So thanks, Rajat. So so let me close with this final slide. So in summary, in this presentation, we just argued that three uh, D scene graphs provide a general and expressive representation for. Uh, hierarchical 3D scene understanding for robotics. And I spent the first part of the presentation talking about Hydra, which is a real-time perception system to construct 3D scene graphs from sensor data, again, in real time. Probably the interesting bit is that Hydra is going to be open source during RSS, so it's going to be online on GitHub next week. And Rajat covered this idea of neural tree, which is essentially a new architecture for uh, graph neural networks, which is drawing a parallel between graph neural networks and probabilistic graphical models. And through that parallel is also establishing performance guarantees, approximation guarantees of, uh, of the neural tree applications, of the neural tree architecture. So of course, there are many challenges and opportunities here. Uh, a lot of the work I presented uh, um, in my part of the presentation is really about doing bottom-up inference to construct a scene graph. And uh, Rajat, uh, Rajat work seems to be like you know, more of a top-down processing figuring out a way to properly couple these two top-down and bottom-up processes in a single inference approach is still an open problem to us. Um, figuring out how to do system level monitoring and certify that the, the 3D scene graph produced by, the, by Hydra, for example, is correct, is also something that we are interested in. 
And finally, um, the semantic segmentation we get in our meshes um, uh, still relies on supervised learning and is currently the bottleneck. If you remember the videos that I was showing in the presentation, the 2D semantic segmentation is never perfect in practice. So we are looking into self-supervised approaches to figure out uh, the semantics and that we can use to augment Hydra. Um, and I will close it here. Like, you know, we'll just acknowledge the sponsors which are supporting this, uh, this work. And I will uh, thank you for your attention. Hopefully there will be uh, one or two minutes for questions. Yeah, thank you, Luca and Rajat, for your great talk. Uh, are there are there any questions from the audience? Maybe I can ask a quick question. So uh, it looks like the uh, Hydra system is able to build the same graph, even though there is a there can be a large uh, amount of noise in the semantic uh, masks. Uh, is, would improving these semantic masks lead to significant improvements in the same graph uh, representation, or is there an intuition of? why it's so immune to this noise? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, Rajat, if you don't mind, I will take this one. So, so for Hydra, what happens is that uh, in the background to construct the 3D metric semantic mesh, we perform some Bayesian inference over the voxels. So imagine that a voxel is observed in multiple images. For each image, we're going to compute the, the semantic segmentation. And then eventually, we're going to average out all these different semantic segmentation when reasoning over the label of the voxel. So naturally, this kind of Bayesian inference over the, the label will kind of uh, mitigate the noise. And that works typically pretty well for large structures. Indeed, if, if you look at the maps, the segmentation of the walls, the segmentation of the ground is pretty good. But if you would zoom in and look at smaller objects, definitely like, you know, would benefit from having a better semantic segmentation because like, you know, the, the segmentation, if you look again, like you know, a smaller object is not as good as it should be. And again, we didn't put effort in improving the semantic segmentation or just using state of the art networks for that. But the next steps uh, for real robotics application is definitely to look into that and looking at more uh, uh, better solutions for the segmentation part. Rajat is already doing amazing work, by the way, on that front. So hopefully that will be online also soon. Again, thinking about self-supervision in which uh, um, essentially Hydra would learn about objects and will learn to will improve its capability in recognizing objects as it goes. Great, thank you. There is one question from the audience. Can you come here, please? Yes. Hello. Uh, thanks for the talk. So I want to ask about this uh, neural tree. So it seems like you need to build a, like as tree we have beforehand before you do the convolution, graph convolution. So I'm wondering how does this method uh, work when we are dealing with uh, like a growing graph? Let's say if we are doing hydra reconstruction and we have this graph growing more nodes and then we need to constantly build this tree. Then how, how can we have a consistent prediction in this case? Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's a, a, a way right now to construct a tree decomposition uh, that can sort of adjust to a growing graph. So yeah, that that's an open problem right there. But um, yeah, I'm not aware of one that that exists, and it's also computationally very hard. So one of the slides that I didn't see in show was like computing a, a tree decomposition of a graph is usually is is very difficult. Uh, it's exponential in bit and that's a computational limitation. Um, and that is one of the reason why the junction tree algorithm is not as popular as many other algorithms for solving for inference on probabilistic graphical models. And uh, what you can do is like uh, there's another uh, work that we type onto, which is like subsampling a graph so as to reduce the graph bit. So what you can do is like you can give a number and say uh, let's say four 
and uh, the, the original graph tree width is very high but you can sub, you can remove edges in your input graph so that the uh, tree width in the graph reduces and your you can compute the uh, tree decomposition in a much easier way so some combination of that so and and we show that using the two all the uh, neural tree also performs well but this other question of like uh, constructing uh, 3d compositions with like an evolving graph i don't uh, i don't think there's any work on that at least to my knowledge so great question that's it thanks for the All right, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you a lot, uh, Luke and Rajat. Right. Thanks, folks. Thanks. And thanks, everyone, for attending this uh, graph tutorial. Thanks. <laughs>